it work? Everything's functioning. We did it! Everything works. The crew did it! We Thank you, definitely crew. helped. Uh, welcome to welcome to the Wednesday Club. Everything looks pretty much the same, but except on our end, everything has changed. The entire <laughs> studio has gone through this oh my goodness. wild if metamorphosis. If you haven't seen the new set uh, yesterday, both on uh, Scaredy Cats uh, on Game Engine and for the uh, RPG that we did last night, which it's was that? So beautiful. Oh my god, it's so much fun. It, oh my god. It, There's been some good gif in. Ow! There was some good gif. It was it was very good. It was so, oh, and the and for scaredy cats was like, oh god, it was so scary. I guess it's revenge for all the times that I that I have been not so great to the crew. I, I saw the Ryan so, jump scare. That was pretty solid. Oh yeah, I I, I seriously got some air like yeah no I you jumped went... up and that's not even the the craziest one. The craziest one is when I jump up and I spin around. Uh, yeah, I'm sure that'll get gift eventually. There was a lot of real good. Oh no, that scares. one that, that one got gift. Oh yeah. Oh, it got gift. Oh boy. Oh yeah. Oh boy! Oh, yeah. Yay! Sweet. So uh, definitely, I guess go check out my my. Uh, oh, I have other pictures of the set on my Twitter right now. But yeah. they can, I think they're going to be able to see the so set later great. on. Uh, ask your Black Geek friend. It's a, oh yeah, anyway. that's so true. That's true. We have a new set, and everything it's has moved so around. It's beautiful. And yeah, this place, this place is, there's a little air in here now. It's, it's nice. We can mm -hmm. do things. Mm -hmm. And you all know our special guest today uh, is Matt Key. Hello! I have a beautiful wife who is practically Squirrel Girl. I like Doctor Strange. Uh, Burning Man! <laughs> Burning Man, Burning Man. Indistinguishable from the real Matt Key. Uh, our, our life model decoy is going well. This is, of course, Erica Ishii rejoining us. Uh, thank you so much for being here. I'm so thrilled every time I get to come on and talk comics with all of you. It's, it's, I feel like there's a distinct laugh because, you know, there's so much good media to consume. So I get uh, avenues to talk about gaming. I have somewhat of an avenue to talk about movies sometime. Uh, but comics is something that I always love chatting about, especially with uh, fine oh. conversationalists like such as yourselves. So this is, I'm so thrilled. And the topic today is something very dear to my heart. I'm just happy to not be injuring my neck by having to look up so much. <laughs> this is a real, this uh, is just, this is just like, just from a chiropractic point of view, this is just really, this is common. Should invest in shortening Matt Key. Yeah, yeah, no, I really, really should look into just like, seeing if we can just take out the knees. Take, take and just, oh, we can get booster seats. Take, yeah. <gasps> we'll just wait. Or, we're like, we're conversely, level. conversely, we 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 dig. Up, we, we move the couch. The, we just the, we can uh, just remove cushions, one of the couch the cushions. cushions and let him yeah. sit. Yeah, so he sits. That's a good idea. A little lower. The Monty Python where you act in a trench or on an apple box, <laughs> but you do it backwards. So much of my career has been on apple boxes. People would not. Oh believe. my God, me too. Yeah. <laughs> me too. I can't have like you know. I I seen some people if, if, or if romantic. I was actually it was. I, I I have a teeny tiny cameo in Stranger Things in season two right. for anyone who's who's seen. Uh, who's any, for anyone who's seen my teeny tiny camera on Stranger Things, what? I was looking at the screen going, ah, oh, I remember that scene. I was standing on a box because I was too short. <laughs> I haven't watched it yet. I'm um, so excited. So excited to start it There's up. three seconds of the back of my head. I hope you enjoy. Sorry, crew <laughs> and ears and all, but that's so cool. I've been sitting on that for like five months, four months. I don't know how long. Amazing. Forever. Yeah. I know, I've, I've not quite finished it yet, but I'm getting through, so it's good. Just think Mark Ruffalo wishes he was you. Oh, for once. <laughs> I wish I was him and his Wait, wonderful hair. Wait, what? Never mind. I just saw him no. posting, he, he was like, well, I wish I could join Stranger Things too. And he was ah. taking all these cute pictures with the kids and all that stuff and just being adorable. Ah. But like, we know people who really did. Well, yeah. I mean, like only very tangentially, so I didn't actually get to be there. You'll see, you'll see my little, like baby Talison has a camera. Baby Talison has a camera. Everybody welcome to Stranger, Stranger Things, Things spoilers. Yes, uh, welcome, welcome to the, the, the least interesting spoilers for Stranger Things. <laughs> yeah, I'm really excited about that. I'm gonna w watch that. Yeah. And, so uh, what are we talking about today? And I'm gonna lead into yeah, no, the let's, amazing let's, Ken Oh Wynn. my gosh, he finished it. It's amazing, and I love it so much. That is, that is. I, I feel like I feel like Usagi is a little feeling a little sketchy about this whole exercise here. Yeah. <laughs> you have not like, yet earned his are, trust. No. I was. Who's that guy? Who is Usagi Ojimbo? So Usagi Ojimbo uh, <laughs> is. Oh my gosh. Is. Uh, Oh my god. It, For those of you who don't know. It's an incredible comic by Stan Sakai, written and drawn completely by him. Uh, it's it's he, it's an American comic. However, it has quite a lot of uh, Japanese sensibilities. It's based all loosely on the life of uh, Miyamoto Musashi. Um, 
and it is about Very a, loosely. a yeah. I mean, it is about <laughs> a Ronin who wanders the countryside of feudal Japan, and he happens to be a rabbit, and all of the people that uh, populate the countryside are animals. I was en point. I was enjoying earlier today his his battle with the Neko clan. Oh quite my a gosh! Bit. Yeah, the Neko ninja. The Neko so ninja. All, yeah. The Neko ninja are all all uh, cat ninjas. Cats, and then the, there's the Komori ninja, mm. which are all bats, and uh, Tomo Tomoe Ame or, or Tomoe is a uh, is the, uh, the lady, lady the and it's just it's so I I was not prepared to like coalesce all my thoughts about it it is so dear to me I learned to read with Usagi comics my father used to sit down and read comics with me um, and that's how I learned to read was with Usagi and it's it's just these incredible epic adventures folding in folklore and Japanese history and samurai dramas it's like a jidageki which is a, like a basically is a period drama mm. in Japan it's like a it's a genre so like you know anything with like samurai or or ninja um, or jidageki and it's it's these incredible compelling stories uh, and they but they just happen to be animals it, it, it appears there's, first in critters there, there, there's actually I, I, I and we'll get into why yeah. this is although we haven't even really talked about the theme yet of where we're going oh, yeah, today sorry, I jumped oh right my in. god yes this I'm sorry right to, I, but just, like, I could wax on about the, the theme today and we're probably gonna do a reverse version of this at some point which is much more my speed is is Western uh, East uh, is Japan's influence on Western uh, pop culture, specifically comic books, mm -hmm. but kind of the interesting cultural trade that's been happening for 50, 50 years yeah, now. It's, it's really an intensely. incredible Ouroboros of creativity. Oh, yeah. Where, uh, you know, Western media influences Japanese media influences Western media and especially these days since a lot of us who started growing up with anime and manga are content creators now now you see it everywhere from from cartoons to comics to Films. movies yeah to, to games yeah. television yeah, everything. television uh, and there's actually I I became aware of Usagi Ojimbo because my dad was trying to get me to watch Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Because <laughs> he was doing some work with, with, with Kevin Eastman wow. ages ago on something that never happened because that was, that was very much his, you know, he, but he was, knew these weird people. And he knew I was an anime kid and so they <laughs> used Usagi Ojimbo who had a guest spot uh, right? in the animated series. But there's a panel, and I pulled a panel specifically <gasps> of the crossover, the first crossover yes. with the Teenage Mutant yes. Ninja Tur Turtles and Usagi Yojimbo when they met each other. And it's in there somewhere. It should be called Usagi Turtles. And it's my favorite panel in this entire so comic because it, it kind of wraps up a whole series of like weird explanations. It's uh, really funny because um, I guess Eastman and Sakai were kind of fans of each other for a long time. And then it was just the natural progression for them to cross over. Yeah, and, oh my god, and it, it's so great too because in the Ninja Turtles, they address it in one of the crossovers in the Usagi comic, how they're like, well, we're weird in our, we're mutants in our world, like in our, well, but you guys are normal. Do you, like, do you have tails? Yeah, no, or he's, like, he's, are, he's, you, he's, are you, are you like, it, like some sort of genetic experiment? And they're like very offended, they're like, Excuse me? Yeah, it's it's uh, <laughs> we're just this is is it, is it is it Michelangelo with the with the nunchucks? I, I can never. He, I think, uh, yeah, oh yeah. God, I'm gonna get yelled at by the <laughs> I should know this. Uh, it's it's like 17th century Japan, yeah, yeah. except animals instead of humans. And then literally, there's a rhinoceros going, "Who are you calling an animal?" He's like, "How did they evolve? Why is a horse a horse but a rabbit a person?" Yeah, just, <laughs> right. Because they ride horses. Yeah, but a bunny as big as a rhino. And what's with the talking cats and dogs and the other critters walking around? <laughs> it's like it's so. What well, yeah. a thing that I love about <laughs> about Usagi and the way it fits into the landscape and today's discussion is that it occupies this really interesting place where. Uh, the creator is Japanese American. Mm -hmm. He's making American comics, but based on like the movies he grew up watching at his like local theater uh, in Hawaii. I think? Yes, it's yeah. from Hawaii, which uh, is very steeped in Japanese culture. And so he was part of the the community there <laughs> and surrounded by a lot of this stuff. Uh, but yeah. but his <laughs> at least we wear clothes. <laughs> Thank you. But his comics occupy uh, a really interesting and important place in American comic book development because they are part of something you've heard us mention before, which was the 80s indie boom, the mm -hmm. 80s black and white boom, um, which is a, a very important here, like period if you're talking through the history of American comics. we You remember us talking about the direct market, which is basically comic book stores? Uh, that's That was the end of the 70s, early 80s. The specialty stores that allowed 
interesting different kinds of works to be made a lot of which was black and white because it was cheaper and that's when we got love and rockets mm -hmm. it's when we got uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles mm -hmm. and with it things like Usagi Ojimbo which is in black and white and and interestingly uh, those creators, some of them may have been drawing this specifically from manga traditions, and some of them may not. Like, I don't know if the Hernandez brothers were doing their model because of the way manga works, but it's an interesting coincidence that this model of one person who writes and draws all the stories for decades, which is not the norm in no. American comics, also comes into being with this wave of creators, and specifically, like, Stan Sakai sits at, like, the intersection of all these things. Try, yeah. Trying to explain how American comics work to, to my Japanese friends when I was living out there was such, was such an exercise in exhaustion <laughs> and futility. <laughs> So like, why do you need two people? It comes out how often? And then like the character is there just not. There are inkers? Not, oh, and they're like, just <laughs> like, and you don't, and, and, and so like, but what happened when the writer leaves, it keeps, like, how does that even work? And they yeah. were like genuinely baffled by, by some I of I was this. reading an article that was, it was sense. in English, but it was like published in, in, Fran in France that was talking about like differences between American and Japanese comics. And they just casually were like, where is in America writers and artists will sell the title? And then it gets handed off to blah, 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 blah. And I was like, I've never. I've never thought about it like that. Yeah. yeah. You come up with a character Whereas, and you sell it to someone and you, they hand it to other people for the, like, it seems so normal to me because I grew up with it, but it sounds weird when you well, put it that you way. Well, all, all the time we have artists and writers and we say, like, worked on this, that, and the other thing. Whereas in Japan with manga, you have, like, Akira Toriyama who just did Dr. Slump and, and Dragon Ball and everything just forever. Forever. And just by himself. Or Rumiko or like, Takahashi. I was literally about to say Rumiko <laughs> Takahashi. And Udase Atsura uh, that just ran forever. Just We are incapable yeah. of having one of these episodes and not just talking about women I love yeah. her so much. And just like we, we used to joke in high school that she's just like changed to a to a desk, like making comics. Oh, she's yeah. gonna make Rama forever. I my first two cosplays were both were both uh, her manga what? from uh, her manga. What did you do? What I did I did uh, my my first one was Ryoga Hibiki from Rama One Half. Okay. And my and I there are pictures they do exist. And my second one was Inaba. Uh, the bunny rabbit from oh Urusei Atsura, who, Shin you never remember Shinobu, who yeah. was like, when Shinobu was finally like, Ataru is a shit and I'm done, she ended up hooking up with a kid who had been adopted by the rabbits who live on the moon, and he wore a little rabbit suit so that he'd fit in, and I, he was just I a have, janitor up I there. I have seen that Yeah, in costume. the little red apron. I have seen that costume and Tiny Tales in it. Oh yeah, oh no, because I looked just like the guy. I was like, yeah, there's there's a video of me in that in that it's costume on the internet amazing. that you can find. It yeah, that's exist. right. Nobody's found it yet, though. No, well, a couple people have found it, but okay, not a lot. It hasn't, all right. hasn't. Although they there are like certain long running studios and things will have like you know four assistants who are helping you meet your deadlines, yeah, but their circles. job is to work in your style and like help you make your like comics. like the clump the clamp yeah. girls were very much and that's like, another yeah, model like a collective. A, Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, which is which is really interesting, but um, Usagi, I uh, it has as you said, it is really kind of this crossroads of East and West, um, both because he's Japanese American, and then you know it has all the Japanese influences of, of his childhood, um, but also the storytelling itself is extremely East meets West, whereas um, yeah, there's like the arcs, the story arcs, there, there's a lot of like one shots that are similar to Western comics. The tempo is um, very Western yes, too. And, but at the same time there are still like, you'll start out one of the stories and it'll just be a whole, like a whole two pages of scenery. Very mm. similar to like a Kurosawa film or to a manga where it's just the natural scenery and no action happens. The, the, the negative space is mm -hmm. the positive space. That was, yeah. that was one of the things they taught us in, in when we were learning when we were learning a lot about Japanese yeah. pop and, art and is, a, is a lot of is is that the negative space is oftentimes what you're supposed to be ta paying attention to is that the object that is that often the, like the object that we in the West would consider to be the subject is often very very small because it's just there to like bind everything but it's really about the space around it. Yeah and uh, if, I'd, if I'd thought about this earlier I would have um, submitted the panel but one, my favorite <laughs> my favorite story uh, one of the, one of the, my favorite ones that he's done is a meticulous recreation of the Japanese tea ceremony, which is oh. yeah. So it's just basically he, uh, Tomoe and Usagi are performing the tea ceremony together. So, so wait, what, what is what is the tea ceremony for those of you? So the Japanese tea ceremony. Yes. Like, in, in Japan, my turn to do it. Yeah, yeah, in Japan, everything is in art, and so uh, doing traditional tea where you have the matcha and you have somebody that is like certified to distribute the tea, and then people that are certified to partake in the tea ceremony, and it's this incredible ritual where you like wash out the bowl and you turn it a certain way so you see the art. You eat the snacks in a particular way. You know, you scoop it out like 
like in a certain way and you say certain things. Yes, and it's like very meticulous. And so he paneled it all out and it's there's no talking in the entire comic. It is just the tea ceremony happening, but in the glances that they are exchanging and in like the way that they move, it's so beautiful because you're like, oh my God, there's so much story going on here, but they're not the subjects. The subject is like the tea ceremony happening and is like one of my favorite comics ever. I, I, I love a good tea ceremony. Yeah, yeah, a tea ceremony is very, something very uh, therapeutic. One, so it. one of the interesting and fascinating ways that, that, that and there's, there's in, interest, like there, there are little things in this book that I love, like the dinosaur, the tiny baby dinosaur fishing. Oh uh, yes, the uh, Tokage yeah, lizards. Yeah, the Tokage yeah, lizards. The Tokage lizards are just like the rats of their world, kind of. <laughs> they're, 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 just, like, they're just like they're just around. They're just around. There's a thing, and part of it is because it's a black and white book, but part of it is also because it's a Western book. There's something in this that would only exist in a Western comic book, which is the ninjas are wearing black, mm. which is a Western trope, mm -hmm. not a Japanese trope. Yeah, because traditionally um, ninja um, were just like peasants. They were wore like normal people clothes. It is not sneaky to wear it's a uniform <laughs> that says I'm trying to kill yeah, exactly. you. Well, uh, but the reason that they wear black is because um, during the era of like um, the Japanese theater, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like uh, the Bunraku puppet people. Bunraku uh, yeah, puppet, yeah, uh, I was they like. Would, a... They would like, they, they had to wear black to kind of disappear into the background of scenery and then, uh, you know, just stagehand clothing. Yeah, it's you're right, literally you're just wearing black comes from tech people. Yeah, from literally <laughs> from stage techs. I yeah. did it not comes know that. From state. Yeah. So like, so like, if you beheaded somebody on stage, it would often. And one of the things that the techs would do in these plays yeah. is like, if someone got assassinated in a play, since it didn't matter who killed them, just the stagehand in black would come out with a sword and behead the actor. Yeah. Because. The, no character did it, it was just the circumstance. Here's so what they also played yeah. the circumstance of the play. Yeah, and so then from that it became... Like a trope. Yeah. <laughs> that kind of yeah. caught on more here than it did there. It was a thing a little while, but like, it, like it's such It was a, definitely popularized by, in the, as you said, like in the 80s. You know, yeah. So sort of the whole craze with ninjas and, and uh, definitely TMNT had a lot to do with that. Yep, and, and that and, actually... Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, also oh, Daredevil. Yep. That's Daredevil. exactly Dare, what well, that's Daredevil. Daredevil. Please. That's Frank TMNT. Miller's personal fanboyism changed the face of comics. Oh. <laughs> yeah, with Ronin. Uh, yep. Uh, Daredevil, yeah, Electra. You, you put on the wall up there. Uh, so oh, yeah. A lot of what I, uh, the notes that at least I was making when, because we, we kind of came up with this topic by being like, what do we want to talk about? The soggy. And it's like, well, I guess we can. <laughs> Boom. Uh, yeah. Um, but uh, when I was looking through this, a lot of it came back down to the fact that, like, the nature of artistic influence is that, like, the stuff that you imbibed and are interested in and that sparks you is the kind of stuff you'll tend to bring to your work. So the generations of change in terms of, like, the, the, this idea of manga influencing Western comics comes in the form of individuals acting out that influence. Uh, yes. And one of the big ones is Frank Miller, yeah. who oh, y'all yeah. will know from The Dark Knight Returns, a very famous Batman story that was uh, formative for a lot of folks in changing their ideas about comics. Batman uh, Year One. From Batman Year One uh, uh, with Dave Mazzuccelli. From uh, Sin City, which he then helped adapt into a movie. Uh, from his slightly more curmudgeonly modern reputation, which is a whole separate ball of but, wax. But most importantly, Daredevil, Elektra, and Ronin, mm -hmm. which are which are very like his his interpretation. Oh, and oh my God! <laughs> I loaded oh, yeah. up some How? of those too. Yeah, his How did I forget his was, Wolverine, yeah. which like redefined the character on such a fundamental level? So let's okay. First, pop out the Ronin picture if you wow, will. Wow, I'd forgotten about Wolverine. Holy cow! It was cow. once I started thinking about Miller, I was like, oh right, oh, that's yeah, right. I'm glad. Yeah, that I was trying. <laughs> he's to, he's the reason Kitty Pride is a ninja now. Yep. Holy so, shit! So Frank Miller did one of the first what, and again, this is like a a, a Western comics or American comics publication thing. Prestige format. The mm. idea in the '80s was like. All right, there are dedicated shops. There are people willing to spend a little more. Like, comics don't have to be cheap and disposable. What kind of things can we do? Um, and if I have the timeline right, which I might not, Ronan, I think, came before uh, some of his other higher-profile yes. yes. work. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so it was this sort of experiment, and a lot of comics creators especially remember it because they were like, I've never seen anything like this. The paper is glossy. A book. Uh, yeah. It's published in a little square-bound format. This is something that demands your attention. Um, and it was like part of his kind of years of, of debuting as an artist. Uh, and it was a four-part story, which was Frank Miller basically acting out his love for things like Lone Wolf and Cub. Yeah. Uh, and oh. 
so it he went on to do a ton of work for the big companies including very importantly like uh some some work on batman uh, shoring up uh, a lot of those influences for him and totally revamping the character of daredevil introducing Electra, introducing daredevil's uh enemies the hand and the from hand. which we get the foot, the foot in, in tmnt, TMNT. Which, is, yeah. which is their their joking yeah, version yeah, yeah. and of stick which became splinter which it took me decades yes. to find yes. out oh, yeah. thing. Uh, and, and he also <laughs> worked with Chris Claremont on a four-part Wolverine story, which is where Wolverine gets his entire, like, connection to Japan and fighting of ninjas samurai himself. Samurai, and, yeah. and the notion of him as a wild samurai. Yeah. Is, yeah. I think there's a, a, a Wolverine Ronin. picture, a couple of Wolverine pictures in there, too. I there think I be. forgot to load up any Daredevils, but... Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, God, God, if it, if it pops up, Have there we go. Wow, oh, yeah. Oh, look at that cover. <laughs> That's, it's I think, the most recent like, paperback hand. version that they do. But you can clearly see the stuff that excites him. So I don't know, and this is something I want to look up, but like, how do we get from Miller pushing the awareness of these and supporting sort of that to the fact that like Dark Horse, a publisher we've talked about a lot, was basically first wave publishing this stuff in English, making it available for well, the first time. Was well, there it was Mike a, Richardson? Well, there's a few things that happened that I remember. Okay. And this is this is not really. I wish this were my my research, but it's not. Wow, it's just my memory. I was going to say, wow. So it's just my memory. We're we're again, which is that we had this this early onset run of 1980s and early 90s um, fanboy, like like a Japanese pop culture fanboys, mm -hmm. and we had these creators. I mean, like, and we can go back a little further, and we will. But like, yeah. Over here, the big thing that happened were these these guys who really were they were into Japanese and Chinese film. They were into Japanese comic books, which hadn't quite made them made it over yet. But they were taking a lot of their their nerdiness was into the notion of samurais and ninjas and all of this. And like I remember reading that Wolverine for the first time, and that was the first time I had ever heard of the Kabuki play Forty Seven Ronin. Mm. I had never I didn't know it was a play, and I went out and found like like that was a jumping off point for me for a lot of things I found out, and then. Manga, like the, the the first big hits of manga coming to the United States of real manga were the things like Akira, mm -hmm. where they were, I mean, like they were so frightened about publishing books like that that it was it was, had been flipped and colorized and, and reformatted. What do you mean by flipped? Mm -hmm. Just for anyone uh, who might not know. Ah, uh, yes! Yeah, for those of you who didn't read the old, what was it, Tokyo Pop books? Oh, the old like, Tokyo you Pop. You are reading this backwards. Yeah. Is that manga, Japanese comic books are read in the opposite direction. They're, they're read uh, uh, left to right. Right to left. Right to left. Yeah. Right to left. And so one of the things they would do to make it a little easier for people to read in the West is that they would take all the art and flip it, which caused all sorts of weird little problems within the art. Um, <laughs> yep. Signs on the wrong side. Yeah, people yeah, using yeah. the wrong hands for things. Mm -hmm. It got weird. Um, oh man, I have so many weird left left hand, right hand. There's there's so many straight. I, if I have time, I'll tell the Admiral Perry story later because that's a good one. But. Uh, um, one of the things, one of the, well, okay, <laughs> okay, really quick, slight <laughs> tangent, is uh, Admiral Perry was kind of the one of the first big contacts with uh, America between America and Japan. It's, it's Commodore. It's the, the Commodore Perry. Commodore, Perry. Commodore Perry and the Black Fleet. Yeah. Fascinating story. Uh, I'll do a super quick revamp of it one day. But but mm -hmm. suffice to say, it was one of the first big cultural exchanges it, between Japan it was, and the they United forced, States. They forced Japan to open up. Uh, trade with America yes. by basically uh, docking off of their harbor and saying like, hey, if you don't open up trade with the West, we will blow you to kingdom. It's called it was, gunboat yeah, diplomacy, yeah, which is diplomacy. a really it was, name for it. It was gunboat idea. diplomacy, but it did end up in this weird thing that happened. Mm -hmm. I mean, like it, uh, it was definitely, it was definitely a little odd. But one of the things that happened is they did party for three straight weeks. Yes, and gave the I, there. There was basically famously once everything got termed and agreed a huge exchange of of cultural at, uh, items and they, they gave the emperor i believe a model steam train mm. a lot of guns which he didn't really have any use for tons of food there was just bank they just ate and ate and ate and ate and one of the things that they did is they set up a, a photo booth they had an old school party photo booth um for people during this huge party that they had once everything had been settled Oh, there's lots to get into. But one of the interesting things that happens in these in the old school photos is that the image is reversed in a in a in a daguerreotype. Samurai, the samurai who got photographed had a panic attack when they were given their prints because they were reversed. And their oh, sword moved saying. to the other side right. of their body. 
Oh God. Which meant, which you only do when you're dead. You get buried Dude. with your sword on the yeah, wrong side of the body. With, same with uh, the way that you cross the cross. Kimono and every, everything. So it's always one way. They except were if you're dead, and then it's the other way. So they were not cool. Yeah. And having this panic of the, like, there's this machine that creates an image of me except dead. What the fuck? Yeah. Um, okay. Wow. And so there was, they're like, why would you do that? That's just. And so they were like, okay, okay, we can handle this. Just wear it the wrong way for like three minutes while we take the photograph. Right. And then you'll be alive in the photo and everything will be cool. And so we have all these photos of, of these Japanese peasants and samurai at the time, and half of them are one way and half of them the other. And it's basically the, are you more comfortable being dead in a photo or just pretending to be dead for three minutes for this picture? <laughs> and like, they all went different ways, which is kind of, so it's like one of those yeah, weird cultural so things that just like gets thrown off by flipping the book. Right, yeah. Oh, Blackfeet, there's a whole, we had a big thing in LA a few years ago that was amazing. But, what thing? Oh, we had a big art gallery of all the art that got produced on both because they brought a bunch wow. of artists from the West, right, and yeah. there were the 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 artists in Japan and who drew everything. Like, that sounds wonderful. There's piles of art from this happening. Yeah. Like just just for everything from the ships showing up and people starting to sketch them before anyone came on because they they didn't get off the boat for a while. Mm -hmm. There was a whole thing that happened, mm. and then there was and then just the parties and everyone interacting and it was yeah, it's some amazing art. But I have seen some of the stuff that's down at, uh, is it LACMA that has sort of a permanent East Asian wing? There's, yes. there's some mm -hmm. great yes, pictures yes, of yes. like the, the Westerners getting off the boats with giant bushy beards. Yeah, I know. Giant bushy it's beards like, and like ridiculous. weird, and like, and like, yeah, like, oh, there's all sorts They of probably things. had giant bushy beards. I they mean, did. You're on a boat. It's <laughs> but yeah, I mean, and, and, and before that, there were only like a couple of Portuguese missionaries and stuff. There was, and like there was very limited contact with the West. There were some Portuguese and there was, there was a, there was a few, there was a few n crazy Nords who made their way right. down there. But uh, yeah, just there has been ever since like the very very first cultural exchange. There's just been so much influence on both sides. Because then after that point, Orientalism and like Japanese sort of like fetish was was huge in the it West. It was trendy. Yeah, it was is the cool we thing. And so people. you have like you know just like really <laughs> terrible looking like art and and like pottery and cabinets and whatever well, and, made in the Japanese style from that time. Like, I think, how is it, like, the Winchester house or something? And they have, like... Oh, yeah. Yeah, and they have, like, Japanese-influenced rooms and yeah. stuff. Oh, it's so interesting. It's odd. I love that so house so much. Yeah. But, and, and, and that cultural exchange has been happening forever. I mean, like, this 1960s Japanese comic book, or, like, the, the, the uh, shoujo, the whole shoujo era... Quick reminder for right. our audience, what's shoujo? Shoujo is, it was, is, it's like it's girls' girl, comics. Girls' comics. So there's shonen, shonen which is boys', boys comics, comics, and things like Naruto or One Piece, or, and like, specifically, there's like a, there's like a, a compendium, like a ma weekly magazine, or a magazine that's yeah, called like Shonen, shonen Weekly. Um, and then there's, uh, there's shoujo, which is like girls' stuff, like, Screw gender norms, but girl yeah. stuff. So like magical girls and like like Sailor Moon and Utena. Uh, like Utena and, and like uh, uh, romance Versailles, stuff. Candy, candy. Yeah. Uh, so you, it's very you may, delineated. You may remember from our earlier episodes that one of the things that distinguishes the Japanese uh, comic book industry and sort of their publishing history from America specifically is that they went crazy into every kind of genre and stayed every there. Every kind of genre. Um, where we had kind of our industry-wide contraction to mostly just superheroes in the 60s, partly based out of fear and distribution mm -hmm. and a bunch of other different factors all combined to make us have an industry where frequently comic book is mistaken for a genre and, and I, not a media. Yeah. And Man, man, I, I like. Yeah, I, I will, I will, I will delve deep into that on another show. But I want to. Yeah, sorry, I want to get back to back to the states where we had Frank Miller and Adam yep. Warren, and we had and like people like Tavisha Wolf, Garth, and Ricky Simons just doing, being these early influenced anime nerds and manga nerds, bringing that that affectation to the United States. Uh, so in the yeah. 80s and early 90s, we had American companies starting to pick up the rights and republish this mm. material, right? Partly on the backs of enthusiasm for like people passing around bootleg. I, I've heard yeah. stories of people like watching Akira with no subtitles and no idea what was oh, going yeah. on. Yeah. They just, their minds were blown by the visuals and the storytelling style and all of this stuff, and it, it, it had stronger and stronger influence. And there was there was a there was there was a, a couple companies that were literally. Publishing manga, and I wish I was, could remember the name of this. I'm sure I've already said it on the show before. Uh, that was for teaching, using it as a teaching uh, English and teaching Japanese tool, where mm. they would actually 
you give you the Japanese manga and then the English translation with side notes and you would actually use it as a way of teaching yourself to read Japanese. And then we got Galaxy Express 999 that way. Oh God, uh, yeah. Uh -huh. Oh my God, yes. Uh, God, that book. Oh, that book is so good. Um, do we have a picture of that one? Probably not. I don't think I know. I may, I may do a whole thing at yeah. some point about about that particular like Galaxy Express, Captain Harlock, and like that, and like the cod pit and all that weird. Right, and that stuff even stems from like a lot of it was earlier work as well because mm -hmm. uh, we. We were we brought up Osama Tezuka when we were Tezuka talking. and yes. Disney and Disney's yes. weird yeah. little relationship yeah. in the sixties. Uh, Who or, is Osama Tezuka? Um, so he is the godfather of anime or the godfather of manga. Uh, Astro, he's the creator of Astro Boy. Um, he did the movie uh, Metropolis, not not the Fritz Lang one, but the animated, the animated one. one. Um, Blackjack. Phoenix. Uh, Phoenix. Oh my God! I had my first existential crisis when I read Phoenix. Uh, uh, the Princess Princess Prince. Right, and, uh, and so he. Knight. Is, and uh, the twin one? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Like, and what's that called? Uh, yes. Know. Yes. But uh, he was I a wrote, wrote, Princess wrote, Nightingale, Nightingale, for Unico. But I might have Yeah. Mm. And and so he was a pioneer in the art form. Honestly, uh, Astro Boy was the very first popular anime and manga in Japan. And he was so incredibly influenced by Walt Disney, uh, um, like by Snow White, just the aesthetic of like the giant eyes and. Uh, uh, Astro Boy's father is the professor is pretty much just exactly a seven dwarf. He's he's like Doc, yeah. He's like he Doc, like Doc, Doc and Sneezy had Astro a lot of child. Forties or fifties? Uh fifties. 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 Okay. Uh, um, here I have a button. No, wait, that. I have a I have a thing. All right. I look at nineteen fifty two to nineteen sixty eight. Thank you. So a lot of Astro Boy, it's it's funny because Mighty Astro Apple. Boy, yeah, again, like so much of the early Japanese manga and anime came out of sort of post-war fears and trauma, <laughs> yes. Um, and like same with Godzilla and, and all of it was reaction to Japan finding their place in this new globalized uh, world and, and just being so soundly defeated in World War II, you know, by the, the bombs. Um, Spirit, spiritually pretty crushed. Yeah. Like yeah. it's, it's interesting to talk to people of the time. And they, yeah, they have a lot of they're crazy, odd horrible stories. Of stories. It. Um, <laughs> but Astro Boy is this weird dichotomy of being this serious book about uh, transhumanism and what it means to be human, uh, but then also he had to kind of sandwich in fighting giant robots for the young boy audience. Mm -hmm. um, and so. Uh, influenced by Disney um, in, in in looks, uh, he in turn, you know, essentially spawned the creation of the manga industry and influence. And every every manga or anime creator after that owes it to Astro Boy. And then that in turn uh, sort of influenced America and sort of American sensibilities. And and he influenced Disney in, in a lot of the later his later work. Kimba the White Lion. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Kimba the White Lion. Odd, is Osama Tezuka is just completely pretty much ripped off by the Lion King. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and yeah, it's, it's kind of happened. Yeah, and but but again, like he was also influenced by Disney, so, who's so to everyone's say? borrowing from everyone. They're also drawing on Japanese theater traditions yes. and pictorial traditions, like the floating world pictures, like ukiyo-e, yeah. uh, yes, mm -hmm. and, and a lot of like proto sequential art, where basically, essentially. Everywhere in the world, the 20th century arrived and brought with it new printing, like cheapness and abilities. And so comics kind of got born over and over in different places with different influences, but everyone was sort of borrowing madly from each other. Yeah, and so awesome. Ukiyo, -e, uh, as Amy brought up, is um, like the woodblock prints that you see that are like really famous with, you know, the guy who's like, ah, uh, <laughs> right? And then, I like um, that you did the guy who does the ah. The guy who does ah, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and then uh, the, uh, the um, gosh, uh, God, it, it escapes me the uh, Hokusai's the Great Wave, Hokusai's Hoka Great Wave, mm -hmm. Great wave um, and Hokusai's other works, <laughs> which have also influenced American culture. Sure. Like hundreds of other views of Mount Fuji, but also other things. But also, <laughs> also other, other things. things. Um, oh, oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I see where you're going Hoka now. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Nudge, nudge. A lot of uh, different traditions to uh, draw on that yeah. had you know. Yeah, but I mean, 60s Japanese pop culture was so fascinating, was also because yeah, I know. <laughs> the world was going through this huge, oh, the Western world anyway, was, was going through this huge cultural upheaval in the 1960s, and and having this art artistic boom, 
and having these also these these real economic booms and all these strange things that were happening and and, and all of these political changes and Japan was kind of depressing in the 60s. Oh yeah. Japan, Japan was and they were really looking they were for the first time for that culture really interested in anything that wasn't happening at home. Yeah. Because that was just nothing good. And so so much of their pop culture was was going we're going to tell a story about a strong female character in fantasy Europe, because it's sure something happening over here. So we're going to go to this fantasy land of Hollandish, Finnish, wherever right. Europe, or and where we're going to tell the story about this powerful the far west. Queen. Yeah, it was really it was the magical far west, yeah. which kind of made this weird pop culture. This island culture suddenly had a pop culture that was was borrowing so much from other places that it made it really accessible to those places. And they started, France especially, was got really into a lot of Japanese pop culture. And right. Europe really got well, into course, it, America. Japan borrowed from France for things like Lupin. Lupin the Third. Oh Arsene my Arsene God, Arsene Lupin the Third, yes! And oh. uh, one of my favorites. Yeah, Lupin the Third, um, which in turn led to so, like this proud lineage of, of uh, within um, anime and manga. Definitely influenced Cowboy Bebop. Monkey Punch. Monkey Punch, yeah. Monkey Punch. Monkey Punch, yeah. Amazing oh. man. Bless him. <laughs> so, we have so many yeah. places we can go from so, here. So, yeah, well, I mean, like, true. I'm saving that for a lot. I'm trying to see what... I mean, so, so some other... Let's, let's talk about some other... The other thing that happened at that point was some of these anime fans started publishing their own books. There was a company called Antarctic Press. Oh, yeah, you were t telling me about that. That did a lot of stuff. That was Ben Dunn. I'm trying to remember who else was involved in it. Like, uh... Um, who are these guys? Everybody still exists. They do Fred it. Fred Perry, Perry is still publishing. Ah. Fred Gold Perry is still going. <laughs> Gold Digger. I just uh, pulled up my, my an issue of Gold Digger. Yeah, if you uh, have watched all of the signal boosts, like I'm sure you have, you remember, I think it was Damien, right? Damien. Boosted Damien. Uh, Gold Digger. It's one of his all time favorite comics. It's, yeah, it's it's like, what if what if Wonder Woman's greatest nemesis just decided to keep being an archaeologist? Is kind of my it's my quick pass of that. Is, Interesting. She was really like, funny pitch. Yeah, thank mm -hmm. you. <laughs> She was like, oh, I'm going to be Laura Croft. They're F sort of it. madcap adventures uh, done in uh, and obviously highly influenced by, by manga highly anime influenced. style uh, that have been going now for years and years and years. It, it, for, and they're, they're, uh, you can see they're cat people. It's, it's a lot of, it's a lot of uh, treasure hunters. It's kind of, and, and, uh, and then uh, the, another big one that this, this company published was uh, Ninja, uh, Ninja High School. Mm. Oh, from Ben right. Dunn's Ninja High School and uh, Battle Angel, not Battle Angel, although yeah, you oh, threw Battle me on that. Alita. Oh uh, my gosh, Battle Nun Alita was the one I was thinking of. <laughs> Battle Nun. Uh, yeah, they had some weird. They had a fighting nun. There was a whole series of like of like weird. Yeah, it was interesting. A, yeah, it's funny because um, <laughs> you know so far we've talked about a lot of like the thematic sort of influences on uh, uh, on American comics, but also you can see it very much in the style. Mm. I put, think I put yeah. some uh, Joe Matarura X-Men in that box. Bless you. Because um, about the mid-90s, we had a generation of uh -huh. artists who were young enough to have basically absorbed the 80s manga boom and start putting it into their work. Uh, and so I'm just going to stall for time. Right. But uh, they should say X-Men underscore Matarira if I labeled them properly. I'm not sure if I did. Oh, also in the uh, middle. Or Battle Chasers, throw in that the, up. In the middle, mid to late 90s, I also wanted to mention, I've been I've been reading through uh, David Mack's Kabuki. Oh. Mm, yes. So if any of you bought the David Mack print, the amazing I David was, Mack print. I was from with Critical you. Role, I was yeah, with you when you bought him. the Kabuki book. Yeah, and uh, he. There's Battle Chasers. Yeah. Speaking oh, of another Critical Role. Yeah, yeah. So Joe Matarira became a, a sensation on the American comic scene, but I, I think we can safe, I I, I did not check any interviews for this, but I feel like it's safe there's to say obvious, he was strongly influenced by manga and video games. There's an obvious right. Japanese and Korean Korean manga th manga influence there that you can't. And, and, and but suddenly like, that guy's drawing the X Men. That's how yeah. much culture has shifted by like mid to late nineties. That that that's like he's reshaped things in in that image, and it's going over gangbusters with a generation of kids all reading these books and watching these cartoons. It's it it's certainly and it, it it's interesting that there's just no way to pull it apart anymore, uh, yeah. and even and even uh, uh, um, the speed at which the action moves in the books has sped up, mm. which is something the Japanese the, is the amount of time between uh, between panels in in Japanese manga is much faster. Japanese manga moves at a speed. I think actually I would I, I'm curious. Uh, I find that maybe it might be more distinguished by a variety of pacing. It might because be you also more have yeah. like 
uh, moments that are very cinematic where like it takes someone several panels just to do a slow action is uh, also distinctive of manga influence. That is, yeah. that is, uh, there, there is a lot of speed change. I do know that one of the big complaints people have in the West though is that it's moving at such a weird chaotic mass mm. that I can't. I'm pulling up, this is something I, I, I was trying to find the perfect book to explain to people what this kind of cross influence looks like and the book that came up and we've talked about this the book mm -hmm. that I would recommend that people read if they're gonna they want to delve into manga and have a really good manga experience as I flip 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 is the Star Wars manga right okay so yeah so, so and it's, it's actually up there I didn't, I oh, didn't yeah. know you got a copy of it <laughs> but we were talking about this because this is again that Ouroboros of influence is that uh, you know, Star Wars is based on Akira Kurosawa's Hidden Fortress. Mm -hmm. um, and then, An amazing movie that yeah, you should absolutely Hidden watch. Yeah, Hidden Fortress is fantastic. Uh, and then, so that it's a samurai film that influenced Star Wars, that influenced this m manga, manga retelling of, of Star Wars. Star Wars. <laughs> and it's just so wild seeing all the, just this weird... It's and it's like and it's influence. this is not a Western yeah. manga. This is a Japanese manga. Yeah, it is legit. Like that has been Japanese translated manga. in. Yeah, with, I mean, like the storytelling sensibilities and the, and just oh, it's so beautiful. And there, it, it so really beautiful. is such a good way of seeing oh, this. It's a story you know. Oh, go so ahead. Cute. Which one? Just I know yeah. I put a couple in there. Like here's the here's the the, 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 the Greedo shot first uh, sequence. Mm -hmm. But it, it's such a it's such a, uh, a st it's a story you know it's it's characters you know and suddenly yeah. you, you you can see them through this lens in a way that will help you adjust to this lens there's, I think really well. There's also yes. another there's a space usagi. It was a, a one-off book that he did where it is essentially Hidden Fortress crossed with Star Wars, <laughs> which blows my mind. It's Usagi in space, and he's like escorting this princess who has been ousted from power. Uh, and and it is so, it is, it's, it's so good, and it's so beautiful, and all of it is just this folded influence of this samurai and uh, Kurosawa, but also Star Wars and sci-fi, and just like, it's so good. I would highly recommend Space and I Usagi. I think it may finally be available again. It was tough to find for a yeah, long time, it, yeah, but I think yeah. it's in the newest Saga collection. Yeah, oh, it nice. is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they made it so available. There's so many things again. I've been having trouble finding for this. I was trying to find oh, Adam so Warren's. Uh, Adam Warren was one of the big, um, uh, uh, the people who were, who were deeply influenced by Japanese uh, yes, comic books. Yes, and I actually I popped in a side by side. Uh, oh, hey, thanks for finding Space Usagi. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I can't believe you have it. At Thank the you. Speed of Jeez, light. Oh, Not like you don't know that. I just like so saying it. It's so good. Because it's like samurai space armor that he has. It's and got a bit of a Doom vibe. I dig oh, it. Oh, God, oh. yeah. It is. Yeah, because they go down to planets and oh. there's like... Oh. It's got the shoulder pieces. It's great. Yeah. Oh. So, Chief, if you can find this, I, I find it, this was just one of the... It's a memorable reading experience for me because one of the image books that, like, I, I wasn't... I didn't get as much of the 90s image stuff as you did, but the sort of late 90s, the ones that got me, what, there was a book that I loved called Gen 13. Oh, yeah. Uh, which I'm not sure yeah. holds up, but I loved very much. They uh, did a Gen 13 Dirty Pair crossover, actually. That's amazing. So they, with Adam Warren. They were kind of aware of this new audience and this sort of, like, people like me who were Sailor Moon kids. Um, oh, and this. yes. Uh, and they basically made a book just for us. So that's a regular cover of Gen 13 number one. And then they did a mini series you've heard us mention here before magical. by Adam Warren. By Adam Warren. It was a magical, a magical drama, drama queen, queen Roxy. Roxy. Which should be also. God, it was oh, good. Oh, wow. It's so funny how ubiquitous the magical girl Her like squash racket imagery is. And look, mm -hmm. it's got it's got it's got the and she's got the the little mascot. Um, they've got the villains. <laughs> Her tuxedo mask, by the way, which is hilarious in this book, is Joe the Camel, like the cigarette. What at, I forgot about in a, that. In a in a in a tuxedo common costume. Just telling her to like, just keep smooth. You know, like he's like, and he's just doing a cigarette. It's like, oh, it's a weird. It's very That's of so its time. Ad Adam, um, Adam Warren also did the American Dirty Pair book. Uh, so with, what's Dirty Pair? Oh, yeah. so Dirty Pair was a very, very popular uh, manga and anime in Japan for many, many years about two sci-fi bounty hunters named Kay and Yuri in the future, and it's very super sexy, not a lot of, like, like definitely, like, are those costumes real? That's, that's interesting. A lot of fan service. A lot of, but like, but like 80s fan service, okay. so it was just, it was a little less like, oh, good God. Uh, but it was really good sci-fi, and it was a lot of fun. Uh, it was, it had a little bit of a Cowboy Bebop vibe. 
But somehow Adam Warren got the rights to sort of do an American version, and so we got a Gen 13 Dirty Pair crossover, which I thought was really, <laughs> and they're called the Dirty Pair because it was kind of a dirty, hairy byline of like, mm. they're far more likely to bring you in dead than alive, was kind of the, <laughs> right. just because it very much the <laughs> stop or I'll shoot, you know. Kind right. of, kind of oh, and that's another thing, separate from comics, is the, the influence of Japanese and Western cinema. Mm. Uh. So around the same time that uh, Kurosawa was making uh, the samurai films, and then all of, like, like Leon was making all of the, you know, the Westerns and everything, and they were so influential on, on each other. I mean, of course, there's, like, Seven Samurai became, you know, the Magnificent Seven, and uh, Yojimbo became like Fistful of Dollars, mm -hmm. and and there's those. But then also Kurosawa was very much influenced by by Western films, and, and oh, he he was, made he made Jap a Japanese samurai drama version of Macbeth that I'm trying to remember yeah, what it was uh, called. Uh, Throne of Blood. Throne of Blood. Oh no, yeah, uh, which Ron, is, Ron is King. Ron is no, King no, 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 yeah, Ron is King. No, it's the other. Throne of Blood is Throne is of Blood Macbeth, is Macbeth, and then Ron is King. King Lear. Lear. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Throne yeah. of Blood has that great. The, I, there's a there's a sequence in, in Throne of Blood that I love where he's supposed to go behead one of like one of the samurais is supposed to go behead one of the one of the enemies of the crown uh, of the like the, the the shogun and comes in with a uh, with a fox uh, fox spirit statue head instead just a stone fox head in a bag and opens it up to show to display like the, the defended enemy and he's like I don't know what happened. It's so weird. It's like somebody is trying to trick us into doing and like turns it into a whole like, don't fuck with me. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's yeah, yeah, so yeah. good. It's, I love Throne yeah. of Blood. It's oh. great. Carousel is so, so great. But, yeah, if you, like, if you get a chance, watch every movie he ever made yeah. ever. Yeah. It's his, his filmography. And again, uh, uh, Mifune, like his. The uh, main actor, lead actor. The lead in a lot actor of these. who is in every. He, he is the. Uh, Johnny Depp to his uh, Tim Burton. I was going to go Harrison Ford. Okay, okay. Yeah. He is more because he's he's always had a little bit of the like, hey. No, I mean like the. Well, they're they're pairing, they're Tarantino. Pairing. Yeah. Hey. yeah. There it is. <laughs> I, think, I, I think he'd go for that. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, they, and they made a movie together. Yeah, too. but uh, uh, Mufune is like definitely referenced. Mufune and Uma Thurman. In, uh, you know. Had a scene together in Who? Kill Bill. Didn't uh, did, I totally forgot that? No, was I think. Didn't it was, he? Uh, no, that was. Sonny Chiba? No, that what couldn't have been Chiba. I, I want to say it's Sonny. Oh, I'm gonna think about it. Bill. Anyway, yeah, I, I'm oh, terrible. Man, I need to rewatch Kill Bill. That's my aesthetic now. I know it I really love is. I Kill Bill so much. <laughs> <sighs> anyway, so I think yeah. we haven't mentioned the topics, but like yeah. uh, cartoons, uh, and many of these cartoons were based on pre-existing manga, but Japanese cartoons, which we know as anime, uh, were from the 80s on more and more frequently like being making their way over here mm -hmm. from oh, yeah. the sort of like early giant robot stuff onto the like shoujo boom of the 90s uh, and and sort of what I now think of as like Generation Sailor Moon because it, like if by the time we make it to the present day I'm just gonna start throwing like magic yeah exactly yeah we're ideas. sure <laughs> um, but uh, in in the I don't remember where I was going with that. Well, ma the magical cartoons. magical yeah, girl. Ma I mean, magical girl is a form in Japan has been around forever. I mean, it's it's a it's a it's a brilliant, interesting form. Yeah. So it's, yeah, Sailor Moon is the most popular of it. But, but there are plenty it, of other ones. It is definitely a genre. Uh, there was Saint Tail. There was a. Uh, 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 creamy mommy. There was a uh, um, uh, candy candy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Hanan Lun Lun. I mean, like the list of like weird, obscure girls with super wands who do things yep. is just uh, Utena. Utena. Yeah. Revolutionary Utena. girl. Utena. Magical Knight. Ray Earth. Uh, Card Captain Sakura. Yes. Uh, oh, Sakura. Oh, yeah, that one made it over to the states as well. Kind of Nadia and the, the Secret time. of Blue Water is kind of a version of a Western version of that because she had the she had the little she didn't transform but she did have the two the like the mascot animals and. And of course, it's very distinct, difficult also to separate out uh, once you get to a certain point in time. Everybody is influenced by Miyazaki. Sure. Like, just ah, everyone yeah. in Miyazaki the world. just sort yes. of drops right. everything. He's starting to yeah. draw. Even like the new. In, I, I definitely said like the new Star Wars in, in Episode Seven. You know, Ray's introduction is totally. So Miyazaki. Totally Miyazaki. Definitely. Um, Nausicaa. You know, Nausicaa, Valley of the Wind. Yeah. Which is his 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 yeah like a, like a really it's it's his one manga that he ever wrote. With yeah, Nausicaa, that one's beautiful. If Amazing you haven't uh, seen the manga for Nausicaa. It's it's just gorgeous, but yeah, yeah you're right. And Magical Girl when it came over here was was the first loud instance of of it was the first time it went from girls read comics to to girls are reading comics from the you know it yeah, just, whether or not you like it they are coming in waves. Sailor Moon was the beginning of the okay this is a thing now and and I definitely will say in anime we felt it really hard because it literally went from ten women at a at our con, at a con to. Forty to sixty percent of the population yeah, yeah, yeah. in a year. It draw, was, it hit like a hammer. 
And there was some backlash. There was some backlash, but I mean, like, it was, I mean, a lot of it was literally just guys just going, do we even have a bathroom for these people? Have we <laughs> thought about that? I remember that being asked of, I don't know where to tell them that the bathroom is. I haven't even thought Meanwhile, about this. the women who were already there were like, I'm not, I'm not invisible. All eight, well, all eight of them were like, we, we got this shit. Just chill it. <laughs> and, and bless the anime crowd took it better than most, but, but, um, mostly because I think it was, it was, they were already kind of like feeling outcast from the comic books, comic book nerds already, but that was a whole other issue. But that brought, because Sailor Moon was, I think, so specific in that, uh, Magical Girl really hit Western culture hard. Yeah. So we didn't have anything like it, and it was such a, I mean, it was such an explosion that it, it has permeated everything and I think part of it and this is sort of my my personal angle on it, is that like not only were female protagonists rare but a variety and abundance of female protagonists was such a like treat out of nowhere that we all just flipped our lids because it wasn't just that there were stories about girls it was that there were more than one way to be a girl and there were interesting stories about them doing the right thing and the wrong thing and making choices and all of this stuff that sort of we started gobbling up and folks like me who also were on the X-Men animated series now had like Oh my like God, a yes. variety oh. and abundance of female characters is a really great way to get women interested in your book and your art form. Yeah, mm -hmm. I Sailor Moon always has a special place in my heart, like on a sort of a personal note, because like I got teased a lot for being Japanese and like growing up where I was, because like mostly a Caucasian population. Um, but then like Sailor Moon hit, and then like a little after that, Pokemon, uh. and like people are like, oh my God, this like Japanese culture stuff is really cool, and suddenly it was not. Like, I didn't have to, like, hide that I had rice balls for lunch and everything. So, yeah, Sailor Moon just was huge for me. And I remember that being the era where suddenly, like, kids my age were so into, like, it Japanese was, culture. It was so I, it was so great to finally, like, that that, that was the breakthrough. It was, like, mainstream. Oh, suddenly. yeah, and, like, and like the four, I remember, like, being at the, at, the, at the anime club and, like, the four of us who were really big Sailor Moon fans were like, this shit's going to hit. It's going to be amazing. <laughs> you all don't know. You all but, don't know. This is so yeah, good. It's this so is so good. Great because it's as I said, it's so ubiquitous these days. And if we look at like modern cartoons, I mean like Steven Universe, mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. instance, is is just it is obviously like if Sailor Moon was like a little boy. <laughs> and um, I mean even there's like tons of references in Adventure Time. Mm -hmm. I think when during the gender flipped episode, um, Finn Fiona is wearing like a Princess Serenity gown and and just there's so many like every a single ton of the animated and creators working on that stuff now are, are fans of this. Just I actually popped in, in uh, uh, there was a, a, an issue of Patsy Walker Hellcat that Natasha Allegri drew. Oh, um, oh God. The creator of Being Puppy Cat. Yeah, being puppy, oh, of course Being Puppy Cat, yeah. <laughs> heavily influenced yes. by a lot of this stuff. Um, so it should, hopefully, if I did it right, it says Hellcat underscore Allegri, and there's a couple of them in, in whichever versions. But what's great is that Natasha Allegri went, like, even more manga influence than her normal style just for this oh, single wow, issue she really? drew of Kate Leth's Patsy Walker Hellcat, oh which normally gosh. had the wonderful uh, Brittany Walker, I think is her name, on the on art. Um, and I'm just gonna stall for yeah, time. Well, I, I, I Did I, I not like label these properly? I'm so sort sorry. of like the, the artists that you see that are like really huge on Tumblr and you know, just that that style is so the pretty sparkly style is so influenced by Magical Girl anime like Sailor Moon and like I love like Babs Tar. I put some Babs oh, Tar back put in some Babs Tar in there uh, if it ever pops up. I know poor 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 she, Chief is <laughs> um, <laughs> we gave him a lot. Sorry Chief. Episode. Oh, there there's wow. some there's some Babs. So that's a page from the uh, Cameron Stewart uh, layouts Babs Tar art run on Batgirl and this is Barbara Gordon in what you can clearly tell is drawing on uh, in the influence of Japanese cartoons and comics. Uh, Babs Tar just loves drawing motorbikes, but like a lot of that comes God, from that. Right? Got it. It's and oh, it's so good. It's yeah. now spread out to the fact that uh, we're drawing not just like artistic influence, but in some we're finally importing some of the the, the other things you get in manga, like variety of subject matter. Mm -hmm. So you have books like Motor Crush, right? Which is a yes. sports comic with sports sci-fi thing. Motor Crush is also in there. Oh, I'm sorry. It's just the next the next ten minutes are just going to be like heavy hitters. Yeah, but I, got... there is something definitely to be said about the diversity of types of books for for Japan. Mm. I mean, like sports anime, it's sports a genre. comics is it's like a genre. huge genre. Like Boom has a comic coming out called Fence, which is literally yeah. about rival yeah. high school fencers. Yeah, uh, and and that's also with Initial D was it was it was a huge hit actually racing. on both of us, which is just auto racing slam dunk back in the day, which was right. the basketball There's manga. There's a ton of sci-fi and yeah, but that's the thing. Some of these are only beginning to be things mm -hmm. here where they're well established over there because they're 
were fewer <laughs> assumptions about what kinds of things you right. can do in comics. Uh, yeah, definitely. Comics is, is definitely a medium and not considered a genre. By the way, this is, this is also our friendly reminder that if you have a topic that you would like us to, to cover in our five minutes on a topic uh, yes. section at the very end of the show, you just put that in the chat. We'll, we'll take a look at it, and it will be selected by a vaguely random process that we are really not privy to. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, throw that in there. I'm just going to say, Vance1982 in chat, whose aunt worked on the ink for Star Blazers. That's awesome. Whoa! And we haven't actually said the word Robotech yet. We but, have uh, not. Oh, my God, yeah. <laughs> the, and, and then the giant robot, too, is a, a whole different Robotech thing. is a long, complicated story. <laughs> oh. I mean, Star Blazers, Star Blazers is amazing. And Star Blazers, they actually did some an attempts at American adaptations to it, which were quite nice. But that was a spaceship. Y Yamato was was Star Blazers was the American was the the Western title for 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 uh, Starship Yamato, which is an amazing space battle cruiser story is the best way I could sort of describe it with an alien invasion and these beautiful strange looking ships that they, they look like ocean ocean faring ships except they had these big engines on them. It's a really spectacular show. Uh, show Deslar, who was like one of my favorite villains growing up. I, there's a lot to like about about the show. And then Robotech, oh man, that's like a that's a long conversation. Robotech. That's a whole other. Yeah. Episode. Well, why is that? Well, to, to sum up, and I'm just like I'm trying to put together in my brain how to sum this up. Robotech was one of the early 1980s attempts to bring Japanese animation to the United States by a girl, a guy named Carl Machik, who was a and he's an odd duck. He's an interesting guy. He's sadly sadly passed on now. Um, but he made a big push to like bring a particular animated show called Super Dimensional Fortress Macross to the United States. Oh my god. But yeah. due to rights and issues and lots of people's trepidation at this, they needed more episodes. So they took two other animated series and tacked them on to the end of it, which was uh, Super Dimensional Calvary Southern Cross, which was part of a it's complicated, vaguely connected, but not really uh, show. It was a show by the same. And then um, a third show that had nothing to do with either, which was, uh, um, oh god, I'm blanking the name, Mospita, um, which... I don't know that one. Mospita was the, was, the, was the motorcycles that turned into armor, ah, and was actually, dude, like, they, ha they had to edit... You know your business. That was the third section of the Robotech trilogy, was Mospita. Mospita actually had to be edited out because the original Japanese took place on an alien planet, and they had to cut out every sequence that showed that there were two suns in the sky, because it was supposed to be taking place on Earth in the Robotech universe. Oh. Because the third part of the super dimensional fortress run, other than Southern Cross and uh, and and, uh, and Robotech, was called Orgus, and it was a big fantasy show with fantasy robots that made no goddamn sense. I love it though. Calvary Orgus is great if you get a chance to check it out. Fantasy robots, it's cool stuff. But so they big moshed this. They changed all the names. They got it weird. They dubbed it back when they didn't really know how to dub, uh, and it kind of became a cultural phenomenon and was like a big influence. A lot of. Uh, a lot of people out here, there was there were uh, some American comic books that took place in the Robotech universe that were different than the Japanese universe. Uh, uh, actually, Tabitha Wolfgarth and Ricky Simons actually worked on a few of those, which are really oh. fascinating. If you can find, I want to say, Eclipse comics. Oh, my God. Eclipse was one of the indies that came out of the 80s <clears> and then <throat> did not survive. In but, my head. Yep. Man. But a bunch oh. of these publishing companies sprung up. Uh, Yen Press, Tokyo Pop. Oh, my gosh, yes. Viz. Viz, which uh, does not stop. Um, the tons and tons of licensing and putting of this, making this stuff available, mm -hmm. uh, and then you start to basically reap the generation of creators who grew up on this stuff. Uh, so you get, as somebody in chat pointed out, there are like a lot of mid two thousand anime inspired cartoons, like Avatar: The Last Airbender. Yeah, yeah that was, was one huge, that we brought up. Huge, yeah, huge yeah, push. yeah, definitely. Teen Titans, the that particular incarnation, oh God, yeah, which took Titans. the eighties new Teen Titans from DC and took had a strongly. Oh, modern. Also, uh, in, Invader Invader Zim uh, was famously was a uh, was heavily influenced by uh, by uh, a Gynex show. Uh, uh, God, what was it? I've just lost the name of it. The crazy Gynex show. Kudikudi. 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 Oh, oh my really? God! Uh, you, totally can see, see you can see you can see a the lot. The weird random humor and everything. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! But then also, uh, 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 Foodie Cootie, like, there's Usually like South Park it. references in, in it. In Foodie Cootie has in South Park Foodie references. Foodie Cootie. So it's, again, this, uh, <laughs> this, this yeah. Snake that eats itself. Um, Wibbly but wobbly. Also, uh, I wanted to bring up Brian Lee O'Malley and uh, Scott Pilgrim. I saw you World. put some in that. Scott Pilgrim. So Scott Pilgrim. He's dating a high schooler. 
What? Oh, yeah. so, sorry. Face and <laughs> yeah. punch it. I, I know. I still haven't. I still <laughs> really do need to see the movie, but like I didn't. I know. She hasn't seen the movie. I know. I, she I hasn't seen the movie. Like I will, I'm sure I will, like, because everybody keeps telling me that I look like I stepped out of it, and then also I love Edgar Wright. Uh, it is. It is. Like, they marketed it so poorly. I took the eight thing. people opening that's weekend. None of them knew what it was. <laughs> we were the only. Oh. They, they marketed it to that's try the, and. It's a, the shot of future excitement. It's our before picture, and we'll take yeah. it after <laughs> once we've shown you the movie. No, they marketed it to my little sister, and she was like, "I." don't understand any of this and don't like it and I'm like oh god okay, no so here was my problem was that I <sighs> did not care much for Scott or Ramona as people in the books I feel like they needed to figure their business out they were yeah that, they were that's why they like them for each other cuz especially in the book versions like they're both messed up so they right. kind of have to work their stuff out together Mm. Uh, and, S and Scott is such a piece of Arrested Development. Like he is, yeah. he is such a mess. I know, which is like, I, which I have to say, Michael Sarah does seem like the perfect and, well, he, casting. The, the, the cool, the thing I like about, and like actually a thing that I think that a lot of people didn't like about the movie that I really liked was that I, I feel like Michael Sarah leaned into, didn't lean in quite as much into the. There's a lot of bright, happy Scott in the in the book. That's very much like the, yeah. hey guys, what's that? And he just sort of like really he leaned in more. They like, yeah, like. I'm obviously charming, but like I really got to get my shit together, and really, and like it made it easier to. It, I, I thought it made, made the it story work a yeah. lot better. That's it's good. interesting because Scott in the books uh, has sort of a like a cocky, oblivious, like it's gonna be fine mode, which is yeah. in some ways charming because you're but like, oh, you're just trying is, to barrel through this. That is very much influenced, and he sa has said too by by shonen manga. Yeah, mm -hmm. the idea of like the happy-go-lucky uh, hero. The plucky hero who has to fight insurmountable odds and just kind of bumbles his way through mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. And a bunch of women want to date him for some and reason. And a bunch of women, women want to date, date him for some, for some reason. reason. Uh, there, there is, <laughs> oh man, Urusei Atsura. Is yeah, it's very all. much so. Uh, he is, he so. is a, I mean, like, he's basically like a nicer, kinder Canadian Ataru Motobushi. Yeah. Wow, this is the most inside baseball moment I so think Brian I've had. So, Brian Lee a Canadian cartoonist who wrote a six volume series of books published by Oni Press That's set in his hometown of Toronto. Yeah. Uh, it's one of my favorite works of all time. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. I own it's it all. I mean, it's Pilgrim. so influenced by <laughs> video games and mm -hmm. uh, Japanese comics. Clash of Demon and, Head. Oh, yeah, it's God. Yeah. So much, and it, in a lot of ways, it is kind of a coming of age story, um, with the couched in in the trappings of anime, and and people mm -hmm. too. A lot of times, it is stuck in the uh, manga section, uh, due not only to its influence, but because the books are the same exact size as manga. Rather than being published in monthly issues, they were published in little digests, originally in black and white. They have now have them colorized all. them Just and they like put them manga. in hard yeah. covers. But the original were these little black and white, like they looked indistinguishable essentially. And they, they move at the speed and they're, I'm like, it's really built to, it's, it's built with amazing care and love to like feel but I mean, he also like, wears an X-Men logo on his little jacket. He does. Yeah. Uh, he's us. And they do. They do. I mean, <laughs> yeah. like, it really is a story of our generation. It's yeah. like it's it's a generational story of our people. I think that's what bothered me the most about it. Was, <laughs> I, was, it was like, a, it's a dark reflection. Yeah, it is very unflattering. It is very unflattering. I, I will say. I'm, I'm scared to go back and read it because I read the thing is, I read it out and I loved it, but. No, I read it at this time in my life, you know, where I was Did like... Did you know a lot of people like that who needed well, to wake up? Yes. Oh, yeah. that would I was be a going, problem. Well, I was going through a breakup and stuff, but then also I was like, oh, is this me too? Oh, is this me too? Uh, so it was really upsetting I read me. it partly as wish fulfillment, where like, this was, you know, I read that before I had ever right. dyed my hair what? any color, oh, was, so they were was like Ramona cool Flo versions of what I wished my life was. Wait, wait, like, did you wish you were Ramona Flowers? Because you were, to be like, fair, way cooler than Ramona yeah, Flowers. Yeah! Like, they like, don't have any ambitions and everything. They're just trying to get their lives together. R and like, Ramo oh, Ramona's yeah. just hiding from bad relationship choices yeah. at this point. I mean, she, I could, I was never, I never saw myself <laughs> in Ramona because she was like, cool. Yeah, no, uh, I But get like, it. I love her and I love eventually that she becomes more than like the cool mysterious girl. She like is a real person with issues. Uh, yeah. And, and they like, 
they sort of come together and come apart and you explore their friendships. I was very interested in sort of like watching things like his, he has a friend who becomes a rock star. And when you yeah. see where, who she used to be, that was so interesting to that, me. That's the one that scares me the most. That is yeah. terrifying. It's that's a terrifying nightmare vision. Of this, of this girl, knives, and honestly, she's like, I'm more knives than I am anyone in that book because yeah. I'm and like, man, I'll say I didn't know I'll say in the, cool in the music movie, until I met you. In the like, movie, yeah. knives, knives comes out better than anybody in the it's, movie. Like yeah, they really, the movie There's was kind of nice. There's a fight over how the movie should have ended, and I'm really curious to see where you'll come down. I'm yeah. so I, excited. I really want to see it. I love Edgar Wright. There's, there's nothing more Japanese love. than having the movie have a different ending than the manga. Oh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> there's nothing more Japanese than just going, fuck it. The comic book hasn't ended yet. We're getting weird. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's so exactly the, how, how they do they it. They were working together as, like, basically the final volume was being worked on as they were making the movie. So they were kind of in communication about that uh, as Edgar Wright worked there, on it. There's a few yeah. things in the final metaphor that break down for me in the in the movie that I think work like I, don't, I mean because in the in the Scott Evil Scott's weird yeah in the in the manga it's kind of they they go <laughs> In the manga, and, yeah, in the, oh, in the manga. Oh God, yeah, in the, in the you comic. Said it. Uh, I did, I did. Um, it could be. It, I do think not? of it that way. Manga is a Japanese I think word meaning comic. Yeah, so in that sense, yeah. Yeah. The, gravi um, the gravity is definitely more in the in the manga direction. I cut you off. Anyway. Yeah, no, it's true. You're right. That's interesting. <laughs> that that's interesting that I think of it that way mm -hmm. because. Um, uh, you know, they, they kind of go inside, go internal into everybody's minds, and, and it's very, I don't know, there's a lot of the storytelling that's also very Japanese to it, despite the American pacing, and uh, it, obviously the, the, the art style is, he said he was influenced by, like, Rumiko Top Oh, Takahashi. it's it's all there. It's all yeah, there. And, and Magical Girl anime, he said Sailor Moon was his gateway mm. for getting into sort of Japanese. A, that makes sense. I, 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 have a, I have a panel from one of the Scott Pilgrims uh, as, like, one of my backgrounds. You know my background changes on my on my, on my yeah. laptop, and I have the, I think we should have sex, casual sex, <laughs> with, like, the arrow and the speed lines. I remember, he's I remember. <laughs> it's just Which like, sounds that. douchey, but the idea oh, is Oh, he's so somebody, douchey. Well, but yeah. It's it's somebody like working up their courage. Yeah, yeah. and it's very much yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, and of course, knowing that that scene goes like so, that's that scene goes so poorly for him I in all the bright ways. I hope somebody takes a screen cap of that and draws action lines. I'm on well you. aware it's going to happen now. I'm well aware. <laughs> I do these things knowing. I've been, I have accepted yeah. the inevitable of my reality. We should mention that there are certain like smaller conventions uh, that we'll casually mention, like action lines, action lines and mm. speed lines. Uh, they are visual elements that eventually were developed. That essentially were developed in the like vocabulary of storytelling in yeah. Japan and have now been essentially exported and adopted oh, for yeah. many many purposes. But they're just. That the the beautiful thing about comics is because it's a big conversation and everyone's communicating with each other. Somebody comes up with something and somebody else goes, "That's totally what I want people to feel when they see that thing," uh, and then you borrow that. And and there's if you ever get the chance, look online at the number of people. Uh, somebody made a wonderful compilation of people stealing the bike stopping. Oh my god! I Europe. I was just yeah. We talked about this. Yes, I love this so much. There's, yeah, yeah. There's, there's one sequence where a bike sort of slides the skidding, at the camera and the, skidding, and the big red bike goes. Yeah, it, yeah, it, it goes. Eh, and then there's a and then there's a GIF compilation of like all of these uh, anime and American cartoons of that same shot. Going. It's so it's iconic, so man. Oh, good. It's so good. Um, there's also a couple of like um, the Cowboy Bebop fight scenes that get cribbed for different things, too. Yeah. Yeah. Because they're that, just so what, beautiful. What did I recently just see that basically had the Cowboy Bebop opening? I feel like I just saw someone like crib the Cowboy Bebop opening. Which is in hard. turn like cribs from a lot of sort of the detective S and 60s, noir. 60s, 70s. So, yeah, 60s, yeah. The, um, God, what's his face? Noir and funk. Yeah, the guy who did, he did the opening for. Like it's a mad, 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 mad world. Yeah, and like a lot of he, he did mother. a lot of the posters for Alfred Hitchcock films. Know, the... Oh, he's one of my favorite artists. He did the Idle Hands poster, right? Uh, God, what is that? Oh God. But yeah, just sort of the sort of sixties. I don't 70s. know this. Ah. It'll come. It'll come. This yeah. Uh, so you also get it's harder to remember these things when cameras uh, are on. I'm you. sorry. We have a bunch of questions like, what is up with the animal ears on people from Hexamundus? I that would just that, have to I be don't know what is like there there's I think they're asking about anime in general and manga in general and why people tend to have animal ears and I would say that's oh, just yeah. mythological tradition of it's, yeah it's from, mythological from tradition the, kitsune, the fox people foxes the fox and girls, raccoons turn into people it's, it's yeah kind of a, the, and the tanuki the badgers the little badger raccoon dudes um, uh, there's a lot of shape shifting in Japanese folklore a, a lot of and, and the kitsune are the trickster foxes they're they're a lot of times portrayed as women and they have the tails and animals you know, shape change into people yeah. a lot in Japanese 
Japanese culture, and it just sort of permeates the pop culture yeah, as well. So the yokai. So that's yeah. that's one of those things where it's 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 just like it's a thing that's just permeated. Yeah. So in the in the nineties two thousands, <laughs> along with uh, the generations one. of uh, American creators influenced by this stuff, and and of course Japanese American creators, there are like. Japanese American creators and straight up people from Japan getting hired to do things like when uh, Neil Gaiman collaborated with Yoshitaka Amino for Sandman yes. Dream Hunters. Yes. Oh my god, Sandman Dream Hunters has like this. Oh my god, I'm gonna cry. Yoshitaka Amino, oh man. Which is in there Yoshi So Yoshitaka Amino was one of the concept artists behind like the Final Fantasy games. So that Somewhat looked, influential. Yeah. Gotcha, yeah. man. Just a little. Um, and, and so uh, he did Vampire Hunter D. Vampire Hunter D. Uh, uh, so this beautiful sort of He's a fascinating style. man. We're gonna have to it's talk a, about him one day because he like. I would love, he I don't know anything fast, about him as a person. He was basically. You're gonna cry. Yeah. That's amazing. I'm gonna say, I, I got to meet him years ago. <laughs> yeah. When he was first doing his gallery and he uh, when he was promoting Angel Egg and that Arabian Nights, right. which just amazing, uh, and yeah, like he basically just kind of got like plucked from his family as a child, put into a room, and they were just like, like make content, please, and <laughs> so he's he just been doing gorgeous it. art, but yeah, uh, like like weaving straw into gold, but for, more or less. Oh my god! I mean, like he created Gatchaman. Yeah. Uh, he's done uh, some amazing mm -hmm. fine artwork. I had a chance, Dream and it still breaks my heart. I almost, have a chance. Mm -hmm. I almost busted my bank when I was much younger buying one of his paintings. And I, I oh my god, there was a painting I mean, called May in Paris that was it was a charcoal piece, and I almost God oh, regret yeah, I, it to this day. Uh, yeah, he he is one of my favorite favorite artists, and Neil Gaiman is one of my favorite favorite writers. Um, but so Neil, Ga Neil Neil Gaiman Sandman, mm. uh, which very much draws from mythology, you know, Western mythology, or I guess. World mythology. World mythology. World mythology. Um, uh, at some point, I mean, he really wanted to do a comic with Yoshitaka Amano, and Amano's like, I don't really do comics, but I will illustrate a novel if you have one. Um, and so he went and found a Japanese myth that had the craziest echoes of uh, Morpheus Sandman mm -hmm. in it. Um, and there, because there are like mythological creatures, it's about this fox woman mm -hmm. who falls in love with a priest, and it's just the most beautiful, beautiful. story of star-crossed love. And um, I have a copy of it, and it is signed by both Neil Gaiman and Yoshitaka Amano, um, and it is like my most treasured possession. Uh, and it is it is it is a story that I love, and I've read over and over and over again. Um, and so it is this beautiful. Uh, Cross section of Eastern and Western storytelling, where it's this Japanese folk tale, but yet there's a uh, Sandman tales woven into it, and it's illustrated by Yoshitaka Amano. And they later took it and they turned it into a comic, and mm -hmm. they had a different. P. Craig Russell. Yes, Beautiful. yes, P. Craig Russell, which is so gorgeous. Uh, but but that is my one of my favorite ones. I the cover yeah. should be in the box. I don't yeah, know if I, I have a, I have a print from it that is yeah. beautiful and framed from a friend. It's it's so gorgeous and and uh, Amano's art also is very East meets West. Yeah, he's he's. It's I not anime he, style. No, he and he I believe he lives in New York now. Like like oh, as an he adult, really? he's got a he's got a place in New York. And he does gallery shows in New York, and he's got some really, he's done a series of like uh, of classical. Uh, um, Camelot, uh, like of uh, yeah. you know, round table. He, well, he does his, a lot of his um, subjects are like you know Western mythology. Mm -hmm. Like he has a book of fairies, mm -hmm. um, which is incredible. I have a beautiful tarot deck that he did. Yeah, he has a tarot beautiful. deck and. Oh, you know, and Vampire the, Hunter the, D, which is a very East meets West. Yeah, yes. Uh, conglomerate. But then he's also done like illustrations of like the Tale of Genji, which was mm -hmm. the very first novel ever created, which is. Japanese and yeah, right. Sorry, uh, I have if, like, if you, uh, if you, uh, the world's first uh, uh, like fanfic. He did well. And he did <laughs> self insert Mary Sue <laughs> fanfic was the very first novel. The second internet board readers, royalty man. Board the very royalty. first novel. Also, was women a, was invited writing books. Yeah. So deal with it. Yeah. Uh, Amino also did. He did a beautiful painting. He did a. He would DC commissioned him to do a, a a Superman and a Batman, which are quite beautiful as well oh God, that you can yeah. find. His version of Superman and Batman, which so, is strangely haunting. Yeah, so, so, so I, Sandman. I'm so glad you brought up Sandman Dream Hunters because that is that is my one of my very favorite things of all time. And there's a there's a couple other folks who ended up like Kia Asamaya ended up doing a run on X Men. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, Katsuhiro Tomo did a Batman. I oh did not know that. Gosh. There's Akira's oh. Batman. No, bottom right, yeah, the far right uh, panel back there is, is Katsuhiro Tomo, Tomo. Who, who did um, Akira. Aka, yeah, doing, He's uh, doing a insane. Batman. insane. Like, if you look at uh, another creator-owned <laughs> and written and drawn book, which is 
bonkers, like the the ruins and the tech and everything in in. Well, and and, and like fascinatingly, like they tr the, in in an attempt to like introduce these characters to Japan, there's actually a a, a Spider-Man manga. Yes. And a yes, Batman manga yes. are both things that exist. Uh, they're really fascinating. I think there were X Men ones too. There uh, was some X Men. There was. There are folks uh, who just draw artistically other influences. I'm just calling this out because I love this comic, but mm. Unwritten from Vertigo. Yeah. yeah. Uh, had wonderful covers by Yuko Shimizu. Yeah. Uh, who is from New York, I think. But like. This, that was also P. Craig Russell for the book, was it? Uh, Boy. I think he may have contributed some, but Peter Gross did the interior. Peter Gross, okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I love P. Craig Russell, though. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Just, yeah. Great. And I, I was I was thinking a, a lot also about the about the the Sailor Moon effect and what, like one of the books I, I specifically picked up this book I'm really enjoying it right now that I picked up specifically. <laughs> what is it? Is oh, the Gwen unbelievable Gwenpool, yes. which I had not Our read. Uh, which is like the most anime cover on God's Green Earth. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. And Chief, if you've got the uh, Dream Hunters cover or the unwritten covers, uh, I'd love to pop, just show people. Man. So when, when there was that hashtag, hashtag visible women, which was uh, I love that. female illustrators great on, days Twitter. on Twitter. That was, that I, was a oh, good time. So good. And now I'm like following all of them. And so many, almost every single one of them has Thanks. like some sort of Sailor Moon fan art or influenced by Sailor Moon or puts their characters in like magical girl costumes. Because as you said, it was kind of the first time that sort of, Girls read comics. Mm. Well, and, came out and, in such a big way. Yeah, Babs. Uh, I I became aware of, of of Babs through her Sailor Moon Sailor Moon this biker gang. Sailor Moon biker gang. That oh, Sailor Moon I biker gang. I forgot about that. I want was all those outfits. Well, <laughs> our friends caught. You know, our friends did do a Sailor Moon biker yeah, gang cosplay. Yeah, yeah. Like, I did not we, know that. Oh yeah, we, our friends did a whole photo shoot. And, uh, and Newman the, and yeah, I think the, Maggie was Michelle, in that. Michelle was yeah. in that. So you get a, a bunker crop of comics with this now. You get uh, our own Kate Leth did uh, Power Up with Matt Cummings, mm -hmm. which was about a super unlikely gang of like magical girls, except it's it's like a lady who works at a shop and a single mom and a, a buff dude and like they all get the powers. Uh, and then Zodiac Star Force. Um, these are both in the box if you happen to see them. Uh, 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 oh yeah, the one you guys just saw was a cover from Unwritten. This is Zodiac Star Force, mm -hmm. uh, which is just a wonderful like gang of very girls uh, who have to sort of reform their their gang. Um, but it came out of like a lot of things now out of oh, online wow. publishing. Uh, I think Kevin Panetta and uh, Ganesho Polina, I think, uh, possibly Savannah. There's two women with the last name Ganesho, and I get them mixed up sometimes. <laughs> uh, but they're both fantastic. Uh, so there's, a, let's see, what else? Well, I, was, I, I, yeah, found, no, I found, I found, I'm, I'm I found another, an interesting, like, like, a, a so moment. Many. I remember the, 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 the first time, uh, Ed, Ed, Mc, Ed McGuinness had a very, has a very mm. anime style. Yes, yes, and yes. I remember the first time that an anime influence started popping up in Superman was when they reintroduced the Toy Man. Oh, yeah, you showed me I that. I was showing you that. Uh, I'm sure that that Superman Toy Man is in there somewhere, but I, I can show it here anyway, which was this cover. Which was a super deformed right. Superman. Which this was the moment that I, uh, that I knew <laughs> that it was all over. Uh, was they made a little Japanese boy become the toy man, including giving him his own Shogun-style giant robot, which is so just, good. I mean, ripped right from fandom of the time. And oh, and then. Of course, fandom making its way into the comics, we get books like uh, Big Hero 6. Big Hero 6. Oh, yeah. yeah which yeah. was at its time sort of like, I loved it at the time, I but it's, it's kind of a hit or miss. Like, here are some things we think we see in uh, imported cartoons. Um, we're going to throw them into the Marvel Universe. And then they mostly nobody picked up those toys and played with them until Disney bought Marvel. Yeah, well, <laughs> I was about to say, like, um, I, I have only ever seen the film, which I really loved, but um, I know that it was very different and they brought a lot more sort of American fusion stuff into it as opposed to like where it was like set I think in, in that Japan. sense they sort of embraced the fact that the characters already were fusion characters mm -hmm. yeah, okay. um, and yeah. sort of made their environment suit that great um, and uh, I, it was wonderful okay mm -hmm. there was a I was just also remembering that the giant monster they fight in that Superman is in fact a giant mutated Godzilla Pikachu mm. so oh my god Oh my gosh, it totally I had is. forgotten about like this this. And and this character actually I will say that I really enjoy the the little kid Toy Man uh, was really ended up being a great character. Yeah. I wish they would bring him back a bit. He was the one who built the giant half he he built Superman and Batman a giant robot at one point that they could use and it was a half Superman, half Batman giant oh, mechanized robot that they could fly around in. That was with like green skin. It was great.
It was great. <laughs> this is this is my favorite part of DC Comics is when they just lean into it way too hard. Um, I love questions like this. Barista Dice, I don't even know what your question is. You just said, question, Tenshi Muyo in love. Why would we talk? Why would you do that? Why Tenshi Muyo in love? Tenshi Muyo, wow. Yeah, that was actually, that was the first laser disc I, I ever bought, I think, was Tenshi Muyo. Oh, wow. Yeah, Translated wow. in America has no need for Tenchi. It was one of the, the sort of big harem anime ones that I remember from it was, like, it was, like oh my gosh. Harem it was It was a harem. big harem anime of the time. I mean, like, no harem anime has ever done it for me more than Urusei. Urusei Atsura for me is is the best harem anime. Harem We're anime. using a general term for a book where there is some central dude and a million women in love with him for some reason. And yeah. usually hijinks ensue. And yes. usually hij and, and Urusei Atsura was the only one that ever really did it for me because everyone agreed that the main boy who was... Ataru Motobushi was the worst person on earth. That's the thing in like, harem anime is the guys are usually the kind worst. Kind of the worst. Scott Pilgrim whereas, was like, whereas yeah. Whereas Urusei Atsura, they literally like leaned into the fact that actually Urusei Atsura was interesting. It wasn't a harem anime because none of the women wanted him. No. <laughs> there yeah, were only no, two women that, who wanted him. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Which were Lum and Shinobu. Yeah. And Shinobu. That was it. And Shinobu eventually was like, fuck this shit. You're yeah. awful. <laughs> but... It was he wanted every girl yeah. on earth. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, or everywhere. He wanted every girl everywhere and was like but then really. But yeah, and Lum, Lum was this alien that came down and right. Wait, Lum, Lum, Lum was an alien. Lum was an alien. And, like, was convinced that they were engaged. He accidentally he yeah. had to save Earth through this weird contest and did it, but accidentally also performed a ritual for a proposal of marriage. Yes. And so she ended up ended up becoming like deeply enamored with him because he proposed to her. But she was the only girl anywhere that he was not interested in, and like actually kind of loathed through this awful. And she right. has, and the whole thing has a whole series of very very interesting functions to the story and how and how it's told. But like, he everyone understands he is the worst person on earth, and he is only tolerated because they all like Lum. Right. And he's the only reason why he has not just been like tossed. <laughs> I had a soft spot for these, but especially like the creative uh, twists on them. Like oh, I, yeah. I loved Oh My Goddess, which oh my Goddess. I also found in American stores because it was translated and carried by Dark Horse. Oh My Goddess oh was my an amazing. God. Was uh, also it's when he accidentally calls a wish granting line instead of a pizza delivery line. Yeah, and he and, was uh, and he was gosh. less never awful read than that most one, of the. But I remember it being really popular. Bell Dandy, like Urban yeah, Skull. And they were intended. yeah, they took three names from Norse mythology, and those were the goddesses arrived. And they what's great about that comic is like they took it in really non skeevy directions. It yeah, uh, it was she not was skeevy. just like well I'm loyal to you forever, and he's like oh I feel weird about that. I didn't mean for that to happen, and she's like too bad here I am. Uh, but like in a sweet, motherly, adorable way, uh, and her sisters basically are like, "Well, we're moving in." Uh, and one of the sisters was always <laughs> trying to seduce him, but he was like, "Not." He was just like pure and gentle, and didn't mean for any of that to happen. He just like when he called the wish fulfillment line instead of the pizza line. Like basically, Beldandi showed up in the mirror. Verdandi in the original, but I yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, like he, he basically, she was just like, "What's your wish?" And he, having like, "What is even happening?" He goes, "God, I wish you'd stay here forever." And she's like, "Cool, okay." And he's like, "Wait, what?" I, it, and then like, so they're always, she and her sisters, they're always accidentally embarrassing him, like at college, where like, he's mm -hmm. sort of trying to hide the fact that like, he's not supposed to have girls in his room, and like, it, it's, it's Amy adorable. explaining it's, anime to me, it's and like my favorite it's thing. It's a very sweet, it's a very sweet like, book. It, yeah, he's so sweet. It's a very like, sweet, yeah, it, like, it is a harem anime, but it's definitely not on the skeevy side. Yeah. Right. It has, it has only the gentlest of moments. <laughs> There are, there are a few that are, that, I mean, like, it, it is a genre that has a lot of crap, but it's a genre that also has a, a, some really shining gold star moments. And, like, Urusei Atsura, there's actually, if, if, if I mean, like, it's, it's almost untranslatable, that show. It's so good, and there's so much of it, because it ran forever. But there's one movie in particular, which is the second film. They made, like, seven of them, oh, wow. uh, called Beautiful Dreamer. Uh, and Beautiful Dreamer is one of the most intense cinematic experiences a human being can have while watching a cartoon. I highly recommend it if you ever, I think you can even walk in not really understanding what's going on and not really know who any of the people are and be okay with it. But just be prepared for like a Terry Gilliam-esque hallucinogenic nightmare. Wow. That gets momentarily really dark. Like not cool, really dark. Are we dark. talking about the same mood as they have today? Tiger stripe bikini. <laughs> yeah, and the green hair. And yeah, the, they, Urusei Atsura basically. The she, baby that flies around. Yeah, Johnny Ten. Yeah, the whole deal. I know all of them, man. I'm in there. They they have a they. The, the, this movie is basically about they're throwing a, a and I warn you, there's some weird. They're throwing like a like a like a 
school festival carnival and like it's a big mess and there's all this weird and there's some like like for better and for worse it's a, a giant lot mess. more is on the table in Japanese comic book and animation storytelling than traditionally and, here and, yeah. and, and there's Dream there's some jokes that, that don't work well that that like there's there's I warn you there's a whole section where they're just really like irritated that like they got convinced to do like a, a Third Reich themed coffee house that no one will go to what? so like we're losing because you had to do this stupid thing what? And, like, wow. it's Mendo who's an asshole and they're like, this is all your fault for being, for being an idiot. And he's like, well, I had a tank and I had to do something with it. And, uh, but they just keep reliving the same day and like the world crumble. Like oh they, they end up caught in like this weird universe where nothing, like everything outside of the school is just melting and dying. And eventually discovering like that they, there's some dream demon that's manipulating them and it just gets weirder and weirder. And like the world outside is just in very Japanese fashion like they they break away from the school just long enough to discover that the world has crumbled. Everybody's gone. There's nothing but the people that they know. That sounds terrifying. And it's really dark and weird. Uh, but I think we're doing a thing now, right? <laughs> Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. you. Happy birthday, dear Chief. Happy birthday to you. Thank you, guys. Thanks to thanks to fire marshal rules, so there is no candle to, to blow out. But happy yeah, birthday! Happy birthday! <laughs> I'd be the one yelling at you like, no fire! No fire! No fire! <laughs> we Thank love you for you, spending Chief. your birthday here on the show with us. <laughs> we literally could not do any of this without you. Thank you. Welcome, welcome. Thank I'm you. happy to do it. I love the show. Oh. Oh. I'm not normally on this show. I hope you like my shows that you TD. Just for ours. Too. They're okay. <laughs> <laughs> he likes ours best. Yeah. Um, what kind of cake is it? I don't know. Does somebody have a fork? Do you have serving in place? Oh, you don't want to eat <laughs> with your face? Oh no. Let's, <laughs> like let's, everybody else does. Let's right not. Here? Let's not have that happen again. Yeah. That was a lot. There's so many Wait, cakes okay. recently. Here's the funny thing. There's been some cake that, abuse on this on this oh channel. Oh my god, I they know. They couldn't even hide it from me because like I have to orchestrate so many birthdays <laughs> here that like there's no way you could get it past me. So I think Sax and Devin were just like, yeah, it's gonna happen. It's <laughs> No one sneaks a cake onto Chief Set. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, I saw Liz like walk around the entire thing. Like, I know what you're Welcome doing. to production. Aww. It is the death of surprise. There is no surprising anybody in production. <laughs> that is but, patently but untrue. You well, you've pulled it off. What's your Twitter? Times. Uh, I'm that Zach Wilson. Tweet at that Zach Wilson and wish him a happy birthday. Yes. Mm -hmm. Zach with an H. Which was almost my Twitter handle. I almost went with Zach, Zach with an H. Yeah. Yeah. Super What's a Baltimore cake? A lady Baltimore cake. A lady Baltimore. What's a lady Baltimore cake? What does that mean? Lady Baltimore, soon to be, soon to be the newest. Oh really? <laughs> lady Baltimore is soon to be the newest villain in. This uh, cake is very in, uh, solid. Cowboy. Uh, <laughs> I was gonna go Mother Panic because that's the only thing we have real power over. That's fair. Vanilla covered in chocolate. Nice. Oh, I I'm might. I might. Do you mind if we like? Do it up. They Demolish broke my your fork. cake. It's very solid. I'm very excited. Um. I feel oh, like wow. I love oh, the wow. stuff you guys are talking today. I threw up a Chiefs note earlier that like Scott Pilgrim was like me at 22. I, I, There's and a I lot think of us at 22. Better, for better and for worse. I mean, maybe that's just why I didn't like it as much because it was like too dark a reflection. But, like, I, he doesn't do a ton of, I like, okay, we bag on Scott Pilgrim a lot. And yes, he's not great to knives. But they are not I mean, having a real relationship, thank no, God. No, no, thank right? God. And, but he is, he is, he is a, he is a, he is a, he is a, I should clarify, not the high school. Not the high school. <laughs> All, not that. I, I had, I had some, I had no, some moments of skis, not but true. nothing that bad. Uh, but yeah, it no, wasn't but even true in high school. There is something to say about <laughs> the path of least resistance is definitely a, a a failure of a lot of people in our generation. Sure. Yeah. And he was he was a path of least true. resistance until he it, decided not to be. Yeah. He's like I saw that and read that at. 22. Oh, I'm so glad I wasn't. When I was getting over that. a breakup, it was. No, oh. that's the thing. That's what happened to me. It's was it you? Good, Were you dating on the internet and just like what a terrible breakup? It is, it breakup is and such a good breakup book, though. It is such a good breakup book. Oh, yeah. Is it? It's no. Because it it's sounds a, like it was no, a terrible breakup. No, it's book. a terrible breakup book. <laughs> it's a brutal one, and you're like, I mean, oh my god, like, what shake you out of it. You fit here. Say eating cake like there's no tomorrow. It's gonna make you face like. You're being a, you're being a, a little shit. <laughs> yeah. Deal with it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. But it's like it, it it really is telling about who you identify 
with in that book and like at what time in your life. Because mm. the thing is that even back then I was like, I have a purpose in my life. I know what I want to do. I would never be okay with just like living the way drifting. that they, yeah, with just I drifting. But at the same time, like in terms of interpersonal relationships, I'm oh, there. My my <laughs> my exes, and I'm not kidding. Like I've made a MySpace group called the Seven Evil, Evil Exes. Like like, <laughs> I was aware of my my place in this reality. Oh, <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm gonna let you guys get back oh. to talking Japanese comics. Or Japanese well, we were supposed to talk comics. about their influence These on American comics, but yeah. mostly we're, we're talking about their influence on us. Well, I mean, yeah, we are American true. comics. Yeah, we, we are we American are yeah. comics. All of you guys watching, like, the, to, you, to them, you guys are comics. <laughs> we are comics. Also, Amy's been, like, supplying my fix of comics for, like, seven years or something. Something like so, that. Yeah. You, you, are, you went to, to, to House of Secrets? Yeah, but that's the only comic shop that I've gone to regularly. Since I, I control the chief supply. No, you, you, are, you are pretty much, any, any new book I read is usually from your recommendation at this point. Aww. You are kind of. One of my favorite books of the last two years was Hellcat, which Amy recommended. Oh, so, mm. such, a, such a good uh, book. Kate. Which came out of nowhere. I was just like, that, this is so much fun. It is a difficult book to explain, because you're like, why does this book exist? Because it needed to exist, <laughs> and we're sad that She-Hulk got canceled. Like, No, I mean, there, <laughs> there's a whole genre of that, like, that Howard the Duck, She-Hulk, like, there's a new and, and now Gwenpool. Comics, making things fun. Gwenpool is fun. So Gwenpool, do you know Gwenpool is by the Dr. McNinja guy? No. Yeah. What? This is because Sean Waters and Boom started stealing the webcomics people, putting them in print. She got Ryan North, she got Dr. Mig Chris Hastings, uh, she started tapping all of that talent, and then Will Moss over at Marvel started stealing all the talent, hopefully in a friendly way where everybody makes a lot of good work and I hope they're all buds. <laughs> um, but like, Will Moss is the office that Squirrel Girl and oh, uh, I mean like I think and and uh, uh, mm. oh, God, um, okay. Howard the Duck came out of. Maybe also Hellcat. That might have been a different office, but like stealing all of this talent they all have in that there. Similar feel to it. That like lights, but also like because there was a bunch of like internet talent with, that wasn't yeah. being like Cookie. stolen into mm -hmm. comics yet. Into different kinds of comics. Well, I'm like, and I, I saw Gwenpool from a distance and was like, and there's like a part of me that goes, this is the stupidest thing I've ever seen. And then there's part of me that goes, this is the stupidest thing I've ever <laughs> seen. <laughs> so here's, oh. here's my question. Gwen, she's not Gwen Stacy and she's not Deadpool. She's a different she's, character. I mean, like, like, like Deadpool is very, is, is, is like, like, yeah, like she is actually like taken the, the, like the, the, the trip of Deadpool and like turned it up to like 14. It's just loud and it's crazy and it's fun and it's silly. It's breaking the She's from wall regular even Earth further. and she yeah. lands in the Marvel Universe. So and she, like, oh, it's okay. crazy. <laughs> and so she knows like all this stuff she shouldn't know. And she's completely disassociated. And beyond just like knowing, like, oh, these characters do this, she knows story structure. Yeah. Oh like, wow, you, right. You're a, you're an NPC that I'm that it has no consequence, so I can kill you and it doesn't matter. She no, you got named. I can't hurt you now. You okay? Yeah. Whereas, whereas like Deadpool is Bugs Bunny in the Marvel universe. Gwenpool is the giant pencil eraser. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great oh, she's wow. just like she's terrifying. Here's my genuinely. question for you guys. That will get you guys back. <laughs> on topic that kind of like self-aware character in a comic world is that at all from the japanese no. thing okay that's here that. that's that's I'm european no. ah, yeah go cake. Cake. Ah. go cake and have oh. fun bye cheap um that's, my name on it. that's more of a european vertigo like yeah. i feel like self-aware it came from I, I feel like the self-aware fourth wall breaking comic books really I never found that in any Japanese manga. I the found only that... one, I mean, and it was obviously later afterwards, was um, Samurai Champloo, which oh, is one sure. of my favorite um, anime, uh, made a manga, and they were totally like breaking the fourth wall. And same with um, some Monkey Punch would do it. Yeah, Monkey he was a little, little cute nod. Yeah. But like, like a hard turn though, like, like came from from Morrison and Moby, like the European, and I think it came from a lot of Jodorowsky. Oh, like British Invasion. Oh, yeah. yeah, I think I think it was a lot of them watched. I mean, like, I, and I will admit, like, I remember being a teenager and watching Holy Mountain and being like, I want to break the fourth wall with a sledgehammer. Oh, That's the coolest god. thing I've ever seen. Oh my god. And so I think I, I'm like, I would love if we ever get a chance to talk to Grant Morrison. I would love to be like, what? Animal what? Man. Was it, was it Holy Mountain? Was it Holy Mountain? Had you just watched Holy Mountain? Because 
Because your whole, like, like I can see you. I'm like, I was like, ah, Jodorowsky. <laughs> it is, uh, I do wonder about, yeah, the breaking the fourth wall in comics, like, who really did that first? But my question about that in part is, if there's a ton of really, like, you would probably know, but I might not know, uh, like, if there are sort of weird self-commentary, self-commentary, self-parody Japanese manga, those would probably not be first in line to get translated because there'd be a ton in them that was very there, difficult and that's, to localize. That's the thing. Well, that's the thing is that for the Samurai Champloo manga and for all of the Lupin, it's like there's a bunch of footnotes. Oh, and oh, well, translating stuff is another whole well, there, other. Well, there's there's things thing like there's too. things like the Helsing manga. Yeah. Um, which. The uh, mangaka, um, oh my god, I'm blank on his name and I'm so embarrassed and hopefully he will... Oh, I do not. <laughs> I feel bad because I've met him right. many yeah, times yeah, and yeah. it's just complete. I met his brother, forgot. I'm like terrible. Um, he self-references himself in the book a lot and actually has like creates a lot of... There's a lot of um, there's a there's a term called oh, SD. Toriyama stuff too. Toriyama. And Toriyama stuff, um, like especially in Dr. Slump. They reference, they do self-reference, like reference to the author. The, the and, author and talks like, to, talks yeah, to the the, the author. Wall. The author breaks the fourth wall, but the yeah. characters don't do it quite as they, often. They have though. They they have though. Trigun they, does yeah. it a little bit. Oh, try yeah, a little bit. I mean, like there, there's there's a weird there's like there's all this space in the gutters where oftentimes the mangaka the the the, the, the comic book writers will will kind of speak to the audience yeah. or make a note or say something to you out of character. Yeah. And, and also that's a, a big function of SD, of, of super deforming characters. Yeah. Mm. So the chibis, the chibis, basically they'll do chibi versions of themselves. What's a, a chibi of version them. of themselves? Chibis, chibi is like, uh, like really simplified, cute. Chibi literally means like little one. They get so short like and fat. Really usually. cute, like little short and fat, like giant heads you and take tiny bodies. This shape and you make it into sort of a rectangle, like the old school Funko is not the new ones with the skinny bodies, but yeah. the original Funko pops. The original pops. Funko pops are those are super deform or chibi. Yeah, yeah. they used to call it super like deform like when super I was young. Cool. Yeah, super deform. <laughs> SD. Um, so they're like really cute versions of themselves, and they'll pop out and be like, "Hey, I'm the author, and like this is a thing that's going on in my life," or you know. No, let me explain a thing or just making little jokes yeah. or, or I probably should have spent yeah. more time drawing this page but instead I drew this thing bah, yeah, bah, 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 exactly. Yeah. yeah exactly yeah I, I totally forgot about that so S, yeah, SD is kind of a fourth wall breaker off and like usually they'll, yeah. they'll make the character look funny so that they can kind of step out of the story for a second yeah I know and even in like really serious books they'll do that like in in yes or mm. uh Trigun as you're saying or Battle oh, yeah. Angel Alita which is like super duper serious like they have like a little chibi Alita and stuff Stuff and oh yeah, that is, a, a, that is a definite uh, trope. But like SD hasn't really picked up out here. Like we don't we don't really like we're we're, we're kind of big on model, aren't we? Like I'm trying to think of places we where we're willing to break it. We get thrown off if people suddenly look quite different. Uh, yeah. yeah, like I'm trying to think of examples. Pilgrim gets where away have... with it, but like we don't really we don't we don't stray off model very often, at least in traditional Western books. Well, and that's been it's like. It's more and more common now where you'll sort of use things for like dream sequence, like Jody does it in Faith, where mm -hmm. she has dream sequences by a different illustrator. Uh, yes, yes, and that, that, that right. gives you a sense of different space that's presented differently, but it's, it's less sort of easily flowing back and forth than your standard kind of like, and then I turned this way just for this panel to illustrate how embarrassed I am. Yeah, I was, I was even, I was expecting to see more of that in Gwenpool even, and Gwenpool keeps, once, once you're in, into the nitty gritty of it, 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 it kind of reroutes itself in a, in a slightly more a surprisingly real setting for a character who is basically living through a fever dream. Now, some folks like Eric Anderson on Squirrel Girl and uh, Brittany Walker when when they were doing Hellcat, like they're lean, they're using a bit of that, a bit some of that plasticity. In those books. But you do find interesting things where some readers are sort of like, ah, they look different in this panel and that one, and it's like, well, it's expressing something. They're having a like the context is determining how they look, but it's something that certain American audiences kind of need to get used, to, haven't gotten used to yet. No, I mean like it, it's it, and I and I feel like we're at the point though where like a lot of these a lot of these tropes are starting to permeate, especially uh, the. Uh, at least in animation, they're starting to permeate a bit. Yeah, Tang's Go does this again. a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, um, so Liam talked about this on Lore Masters. He talked about 302. So uh, the influence, it, it, it happens even in the voiceover of acting in American mm -hmm. versus Japanese voiceover. Mm -hmm. What's 302? So the, so the 302 is, it's a joke. There's no one through 301, but like, give me a 302 is like a noise. It's the anime gasp. 
Like, so an American gas, and, and God, I, I feel so dumb like, saying this because Liam oh. said it so much better. Hmm? Uh, an yeah. American gas is the, like, like, an, like a gas, how you normally gas. But Japanese an gas, gas is an exhale. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and it's very distinctive. They roll up, roll down, open mouth, clench, uh, clench teeth, close mouth. It's got about nine permutations, and you just learn to do them. And there's a 302 for every occasion. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. Man, I've done so, but there's hundreds of them, probably yeah, thousands but at this point. So in my life. it's very, it's like that's like a Western versus an Eastern thing. And as Can't Liam was explaining, and, and yeah, well, and, Can't and I'm, teach a British actor well, to I'm do it. sure Boy, I've tried. that you have experienced this too over the course of all of your voiceover. That like that was very much an, a, an anime dub thing, and then in in Western in Western cartoons, like it, that was not. No, you don't. You don't acceptable. ever do it. You don't but ever do it. But now they do it. Now, you, now they ask for the 302 in American dubbing. Yeah. Or an American voiceover. Voiceover. It's it's become it's it's one of those interesting things that even in American action cartoons, they used to not um, emote their action sequences. Yeah. Action sequences in, in animation used to just be silent vocally unless something big was happening. You'd have fight, 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 and then just someone would pick something up and be here, ah, and yeah, they'd throw it. it's all effort. But in, in Japanese animation, everything was, was, uh, was yeah. <laughs> and like, you just do these whole. And it's kind of cartoony in a lot of ways. And, but then now but it's, it's started so for me visceral. Western cartoons. Yeah, too. and it's starting to become a thing that people are used to doing and used to hearing, so it's becoming more of a thing. And like for those of us who have been doing it forever, it's really fascinating. Like, oh, now, now okay, now we're yeah, doing no, this and stuff. So now. I'm, I feel like I'm, I'm just coming into it and stuff, and so it feels normal to, to do all that. And but it's because, again, this whole generation, our whole generation, who grew mm -hmm. up with Japanese uh, content, is suddenly making content here now, and they want that. They I want it seems normal. Though. Yeah. I know this is a comic book show, but what are some movies that have had like can, can some movies that, that have had like definite anime anime influence? I mean, Scott it Pilgrim, Scott Pilgrim kind Pilgrim. of. De no, definitely. Because, like, but I mean, like because it's the comic book anime, into the yeah um, Pacific Rim. Pacific Rim mm -hmm. is like kaiju, and in addition to being just like Godzilla. Uh, also, just giant the robots, look of it. giant Evangelion. robot, yeah, even Galien. Uh, uh, Kill Bill. Oh my God, Kill has Bill. a lot. Oh my God, so even the Kill Bill, so, yeah, the, the anime sequence um, is so legit. Um, the Oren Ishii origin story is, mm. is animated by a very prestigious. Um, production house in Japan, Madhouse. Uh, Madhouse. They did like Summer Shan Flu and Cowboy Bebop. X the movie and, and tons yeah, of cool shit. Yeah, they, they do they do great is, work oh, and man. that's such a good sequence. What is the movie? There was a movie actually based off. I was just talking the movie that was it, took a lot from Beautiful Dreamer from that Luther Seyatsura film that I love so much, and it's the movie <laughs> um, Richard O'Brien plays a creepy creepy monster. What is the movie called? It's about a city that's like in a like being. Stolen by aliens who are resetting the same day over and over again. Oh, I don't know that one. Oh my God, this is so embarrassing that I'm forgetting this film. Day after tomorrow. No, older. Oh well, but the day after tomorrow again is. Uh, oh yeah. Or no, not the day after tomorrow. Um, live, die, repeat. Uh, oh yeah, uh, yeah. All, yeah. You all you need, need to do. Kill. Is, all, uh, you need uh, kill. all you need is kill. Uh, which was a fantastic um, film that I wish more people had seen. Why didn't you see it? Um, I. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm looking up this movie because you guys need to see this movie. Tomorrow. Yeah, just tomorrow. We'll yeah. Movie, right? Dark um, City. Oh, City. I need to see okay, that movie. Dark that City is amazing. Um, you should totally see it, and it is it is it takes, and they are, they make no bones about it. They borrow a lot from you. Say that's really The Matrix. Any the Matrix. Oh, God. We didn't even, oh, that was the other thing. Yeah, The Matrix. We were going to, uh, 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 Ghost in the Shell. It yeah. is so influential. It's like Ghost in the Shell and Blade Runner and just all of Everything that. Everything borrows. Every, it's, and, it's a giant uh, um, mishmash. But then also, all of Darren Aronofsky's stuff, yeah. like Black Swan is essentially a Satoshi Kon film, <gasps> Perfect Blue. Oh, I yes. love Perfect yeah. Blue. It's, Which is like, but it's so hard to watch. I, it makes I me... have not seen it because I, I am so squeamish and it is very a lot of body horror. It's a lot of body, and like, and like Perfect, yeah, Perfect Blue, I saw it in a theater and was like, this is, is a lot no and way. I wanna go home, there but it's There is no amazing. way that I can watch that film and be okay. I worked on Paranoia Agent, which was another like, Oh, oh, yeah. Again, oh. Satoshi Kon That's is a Satoshi fantastic, Kon. fantastic. He did Tokyo Godfathers, Paprika. Oh, uh, Inception. Inception. Which mm. is a lot of, drew a lot from Paprika. Um, You're getting a lot of Japanese influence. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, yeah. 
I love the way that, that different cultures can communicate with each other through pop. Pop culture is such a fascinating, important you know, thing, and I um, love Adi the way Shankar, that. who um, executive produced um, the new Castlevania series, in addition mm. to, and he right, did all friggin'. the he did the bootleg the bootleg universe of like the Power Rangers fan film, I love and, like the, the, uh, the Punisher film so fan much. film. Um, he's like a huge anime manga video game fan, and he says that um, pop culture is a universal language. And I love, like, just the, the symbolism within it. It's something that we all understand. And I really love that concept My, because it's true. It's a I universal currency. I would tend to currency. argue also that, like, because pop culture is culture, and culture is just the stories we tell ourselves, and those are, like, the human experience distilled. So that's why the, you have a Kurosawa version of King Lear. The, the, yeah. The, the, the pop, <laughs> yeah, just these people things People misunderstand what people. pop means. And, and people also sometimes conflate it with bubblegum culture, which is mm. a different thing. Right. Pop culture just means the culture of the now. Yeah. That's what it's about. Pop means it's happening right Popular now. Pop means a bunch of people are have access popular. to it and are interested it's a, in it. It's a Polaroid because popular about can also us. become classic too. Mm -hmm. Oh, I mean like I mean And that's what lives on is the pop culture that is just good. Oh man, I got to find this essay that this is an amazing essay about how pop culture but it's important to remember that Shakespeare was pop culture. Yeah. Once. yeah. I always point to that and then um, Beatles. Beatles were are very much are like are like the height of pop culture or things like even even Treasure Island was Treasure Island is a was, was Holmes. the Harry Potter of the of the of the yeah. of the nineteenth century. Yeah. I mean, this was this was there were there were people at the time who were looking at Sherlock Holmes and Harry, and uh, Treasure Island and even Shakespeare and going like, "Wow, Ooh, this is the schlock that illiterate people enjoy." Yeah, yeah. Like, like and Jane like, Austen's defense of the novel. Uh, as a, an, in, a buried in one of her early books, right. is, uh, the famous sort of like, what's so bad about writing fiction books about people's lives? Yeah. It's just like buried in there because not the, trashy. people are like, oh, there's no moral instruction in this, and women like it, so that's weird. Yeah. You know? <laughs> like, yeah. But pop is ref plot, pop is extremely reflective, and pop is is a great way of of. If you get really good at ingesting, it is a great way of learning a lot about who we are right now, and that's that's really important. It's a very important yeah. part of art. And I, I mean, and it's also... Note, hi, Matt Colville. I don't know if you're still here, but apparently... Was Matt Colville in the... Oh, hello! Enough? Hello, Matt Colville. The uh, internet says hello. <laughs> hello. Uh, I don't know why I'm doing uh, creepy serial killer voice. <laughs> yeah, um, and, and for creating content, it's it's super important to ingest pop You have as to know well. what's happening in the world, and it's a great way for cultures to communicate. I mean, like, it is it is the unconscious... It is the collective unconscious of, mm -hmm. of, an, in, of an entire country communicating with the collective unconscious of another country. I mean, like, this is intense, good shit. You know, when we sent up uh, Voyager mm. um, the uh, into space, Gonna like, we packed about the gold it. Disc? What? You gonna talk about the gold disc? I mean, yeah, we, we packed yeah. it with, like, all sorts of pop culture, essentially, like, rock and roll music mm -hmm. and, and stuff that was popular then, you know, because that, that's essentially who we are. That's the distillation of who we are as humans, is culture and pop culture. Art and design. We should probably do our five minute other than my yeah, like, grand we'll charge of like, art and design. Yeah. <laughs> we have a winning topic for our five minute topic challenge. Uh, Eric is cheating uh, oh. at the moment. Oh, I, I did not, I can't, I can't read. We're gonna have five minutes on the clock. Okay. Uh, uh, for oh, our boy. Wednesday club challenge. And this week it comes from Adrian Merriman. And he says, what about this for a five minute topic? If you could create a manga based on a comic book story, not the characters, which story would you choose and why? Wait, the story, not the characters? Apparently. So, like, don't just say, I want Wolverine, but a manga. Be like, I would like to what see What story would be interesting to tell from a, from a, okay, yeah. I can do that. I can do, are, are you going to start or? The clock has disappeared. The, clo the clock time. has vanished. We're free. <laughs> oh, we're not Never free. Never mind. Am I starting? Okay, I know I can start. I'll actually say like like this is a I mean like this is technically a big long story, but I think it would it would I would love to see it through a through a a, a different cultural perspective would, would be the Invisibles. Oh. I feel like the Invisibles. Oh my god. The gosh. Invisibles would be. I would love to see someone so divorced from the, from the British pop culture that influenced it from the from and from the. Uh, American pop culture that influenced it really take a stab at it. It's basically just for those of you who don't know, The Invisibles is kind of the story of a group of anarchists who are attempting to destroy the very notion of authority, like fundamentally from the earth, and 
free us from the control of all of these dark things that, that, that corrupt our lives from, from hate, selfishness, pain, and instead just sort of discover that there are really, it, by the end of it, that it's far more complicated than that and there are no sides and it's really just about making everybody happy. It's a lot. Um, I feel like it's cheating because we already got a little taste of it, but yeah, Sandman, Ooh. for sure. Just because of, of the grand high fantasy and the themes are, are so universal and yet very told in a very Western way. Mm -hmm. um, and so it would be really interesting to see all of that through the lens of, of a manga and just the paneling. I'm thinking about the paneling because it's, it's very specific. Um, in like a Neil Gaiman sort of plotted out sort of way, but to see it, you know, with with like, you know, the 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 action shots that take a lot of time, and um, you know, the the action lines and the close up faces, and uh, just the different kind of storytelling for it would be so interesting. Mm. Mm. Yeah, into that one. Sandman, and and again, like the mythology. And, and to see if they could rework it again, a lot of it into with, with <sighs> Japanese themes, because there's just so many universal Japanese, you know, myths. Okay. And so, yeah, well now I want to see more of that, because they, like part of what Sandman does is sort of redeem the idea of death, who's a figure of terror in Western <gasps> culture, yes. but that would have a very different meaning in a place where like the relationship with death is, is in some works already more of like, seen as not a benevolent force, but like as a, you know, necessary, yeah, a natural life. Force. Like, yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, my my other thing, uh, I have a really out there choice, and uh, this would just be fun choice. The this would just be fun choice is Wicked and Divine. Yes, Ooh! I knew that. I, I knew we were one of you going to say it. Because do it with uh, pop stars and idols, uh, like the uh, idol boy band. No, like, I'm into it. Uh, I J-pop, like the idol uh, scene in Japan. Uh, Go ahead. Which is currently like, and especially K-pop right now is exerting a tremendous Exploding. influence on American comics in the form of artists who are obsessed with their outfits. Oh my God. Those yeah. outfits are um, nuts. It's great. Uh, and then my really out there choice is, and I hope that this already exists, it wouldn't be an adaptation, but what I would love to read is an equivalent, essentially. If there is a Japanese equivalent of Watchmen, something that, <sighs> that takes a hundred years of or like the entire history of cultural productions and a bunch of the assumptions, the same way that Watchmen is drawing Ooh. all the way back to the Pulps and Jules Verne and everything that looked to Alan Moore like, and the conventions of superhero comics, and it might not work because there's not a dominant genre, but if there are works that sort of, that take apart their own history while just telling a straightforward narrative in that same way, I want them to get out. Okay, another few. reason, well, specifically Watchmen, I was thinking about because, like, the, the atom bomb, like, the, the the bombing of Hiroshima sort of allegory within that, that, that would be interesting to examine through that. Um, the idea I, I of... I kind of feel like on a certain level, Akira is sort of the Watchmen of Japan. It is. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're totally right. In, in a lot of ways, it is. In a lot of ways, it is. Um, it has more sort of compassion on its, like, the leads of Akira... Like, because yeah. everybody's sort of garbage kinder. in Watchmen. I love them, but they are. They are, they are all like, garbage. Yeah. I it, mean, it's, that's it's, just the futility of being a human in the world where there's a, a god, essentially. <laughs> well, and it, it, is, is, it is the, the musings of the only post-nuclear culture on, on planet Earth. Yeah. It's so. Uh, it's so interesting. Yeah, that and then also, again, the... Uh, the paneling and and the, just the very the manga sensibilities oh, there, yeah. because because like Alan Moore scripts things out in such a specific way and there's like fearful symmetry that's like oh. yeah. backwards and forwards um, it would be so interesting to see it done in a manga style because you know there's just certain I would love to see Atomo Atomo take a take a stab oh at my that. god Katsuhiro Atomo doing oh. it and like it would be so bonkers. To see him do yeah, that. I'm thinking about this now. This is the ten seconds. Oh, I, that's that's my dream. Yeah, Watchmen. I think I'd go with Watchmen <laughs> mm -hmm. out of Solid. all of those. Yeah. So and much choice, Amy. Four to midnight. Three, <laughs> two, <laughs> one. one. Uh, Bam! Thank you for that excellent question, Adrian Mirman. This has been our five-minute topic on Wednesday Club. I'm Amy Dallin. This is Talison Jaffe, and special guest Eric Ishii. I'm Matt Key. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Where, where can they watch it if they're not? If you're not watching this uh, live right now, you can find it on twitch.tv slash geekandsundry and at projectalpha.com. Uh, That's super good. I love, these are so much fun. That was Thank a you. really, that really was good really, topic. That was really, really fun. Yeah. And we only have a couple minutes left, so let's see. What else did I write down that Even we haven't Gillian talked about? was kind of a takedown of the oh, giant robot. Of, of the giant robot. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, that, that's so interesting because, yeah, before that, you'd only had sort of straightforward, like, ah, save the universe. 
uh, giant robots, and then this examined the emotional toll that well, it took on people. It, it did, and it also really took apart the whole notion of the genre, which was, yeah. like, was that these young boys were relating to the robots built by their fathers, and this whole notion of like the, the robot boy, the robot young boy pilot was really about father-son relationships yeah. and how they go get so fucked up. And this was the first time to go like, oh no, let's really dive into that. There's <laughs> a lot of great, like, interesting sort of family issues and like modern societal critique. You get things like Battle Royale, which is sort of oh. like a here's where we are as a society. What does it mean? Like a, uh, Battle Royale is a so, fascinating okay, story. I still, I still need to read the novel. I hear it's incredible. Um, that movie, it's one of my favorite films. The idea of the fear of youth culture in Japan was definitely a post-war thing. It was. Too. It was fear of youth weird, culture. We had that too. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was a fear <laughs> of youth culture, and it was. And it was also. I mean, like the the the, the director, the the creator of Battle Royale, would, like talked. I mean, he he was a schlock sci-fi filmmaker, and he made some amazing schlock sci-fi. He made a movie called Green Slime, I think, which was a lot of fun. But like he, yeah, he told a he he had a he had his war story, which was, which was a lot of battle what Battle Royale came from, which was like. His school got bombed during the war, and yeah. like, literally, he was like one of the four survivors who like crawled I had out no from idea. like, yeah, like it was apparently like there was a lot of heavy of like it was a very heavy like. Thankfully, the the bodies on top of me like like saved like I was saved by a wall of meat of my oh, friends wow. who yeah. like heavy shit. So the the angle that I had sort of like because I saw it in class um, in like they a Japanese what? class. We saw a battle royale because he was trying to make the point. This this poor professor who was one of the favorite people I ever studied with. He had an entire crop of kids like me who saw Sailor Moon and got really into Japan. And like I got real self conscious about it because we were like this generation of pop culture junkies. Sure. Um, I, right. the, I think I've told the story before, but I once asked one of my professors like, uh, "Is this weird?" And she was just like, "No, man. I've been teaching Japanese since the '80s. People used to just want to learn it to make money. At least you guys care about something." Yeah. Uh, but uh, the, uh, this... you never told me that. I didn't know <laughs> you were so about that. That's a well, because I, I was, you know, Sibili. very much aware that, like, I, I just fell in love with the language and, and yeah. It was but like, we were studying Battle Royale in the class, and he was trying to make the point that, like, as much as had made its way over, there were things that were uniquely Japanese or that were commenting on specifically Japanese things. So mm -hmm. he was talking about the economic slump of the early '90s mm -hmm. and the way that that created the context for a lot of these kind of dystopian things that we were seeing. Is sort of the if working hard can still result in this really bad time, then we're questioning some of these ideas that were driving us up till and now, it, and it was... And it's really such a fat, it's a, I, I know we're running out of time, but it's, it's such a fascinating story in the fact that it was one of those things that I remember my, my, my film junkies friends and I talked about that there was just no way, it was one of those films that had, there was no way to adapt it to the U.S. market culturally. Yeah. Like, this is a film that cannot culturally exist in the United States, it is so uniquely Japanese that... I mean, Except like we, we got our commentary on poverty in the form of Hunger Games. Yes. Yeah. Which was our where which was our version of that. I know we have to wrap yeah. up. Yeah. Oh, way too much time. fun. So much to talk about about like Japanese and American cultural influences both ways. And I thank you so much for thank having me. Thank you for being on. here. Thank you for being talk here. It's this. amazing. This is so great. This is so, and we could just keep talking. We'll probably keep talking. We're going to go outside. We, we, uh, we have dinner to eat. So. The moral of yeah. the story is read Usagi Hojimbo. <laughs> oh, gosh, yes. Check please. out all of this stuff. I know there'll be a big list on the website that you can see everything yeah, we and, talked and about. Like, Are we cool to announce next week? Let's just do it. I, I, I mean, I, I don't, we have a, we'll What's say we have week? a special guest. Are we confirmed next week? Can we announce? Not confirmed? Okay, I'm getting a look. We're just going to say next oh. week's exciting. Next week. Next week should be exciting, but, but I mean, like, we're gonna. It's, we it's know gonna what be, we're talking about. We know what we're talking about, so we can say that. We're talking about Thor. We're talking about Thor, for reasons. Yay! For reasons. Uh huh. I talked uh -huh. Talison into a doing the topical one. Yeah, but yeah, we're just excited about Thor. Thor. Mm -hmm. I went ow. Our guest is not Thor. That would be cool. That would be, that cool. be cool. I uh, I did <laughs> see uh, Thor Ragnarok. It is very good. <laughs> it is my favorite Marvel film. I'm going to try and see That's it. That's awesome! And I'm going to try and see it before, before, the, before the show. It's very sexy. That's true. Hi, Jeff Goldblum. Anyway, <laughs> uh, I'm name is Talison Jaffe. You can find me at, at Executive God. I'll say you who it is. Good? All right, we got we got producer approval. Uh, assuming that nothing changes, which everyone is busy and have crazy schedules, uh, I believe we will be joined next week by Phil Lamar. Yeah. Talk about Thor. Amazing, talented dude Boom. and big old nerd. Big old yeah. nerd. Yeah, huge nerd. Uh, it'll be a good time. Anyway, thank you for watching. Uh, stay tuned for uh, Ask Your Black Geek Friend, Yay. which will be uh, I think on a brand new set. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, check and it out. Damien with your gold digger questions. Bla brand new set. <laughs> Ask about ask about gold diggers. It's gonna be great. Talk to you soon. Good night. Read Good some night. books.